Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 26th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2014? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent? No apologies have been received, and I welcome Patrick Harvey, a member in charge of the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill, to the meeting. And before I go into the other business, I, I want to say to Patrick, delighted to have you, but I know Patrick would agree with me that Margot MacDonald would have relished uh, coming to the Justice Committee to pursue a bill, though I suspect we wouldn't have got many questions in ourselves if Margot had been here, but uh, very pleased to see you, Patrick. Uh, item one um, uh, is the, I'm advice asking the committee to agree to consider our work programme under item four in private. Are you agreed? Uh, item two, the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill. It's an evidence session on that bill. The Health and Sport Committee, as lead committee, will examine the bill in its entirety. As secondary committee, we've agreed to focus our scrutiny on the criminal and civil liability aspects of the bill, in particular, the legal and practical application of the provisions in the bill and on human rights issues. And we have two panels of witnesses today. So our first panel, and I welcome to our meeting, Professor Alison Britton, convener of the Health and Medical Law Committee, and Cora Riddle, head of professional practice at the Law Society of Scotland, David Stevenson, QC, from the Faculty of Advocates, Professor Alan Miller, chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And I think, Professor Britton, you want to make some kind of statement of interest. I, I do, thank you. Good morning. Um, may I make a personal statement that I was appointed advisor to the Health Committee of the Scottish Parliament in its consideration of the general principles of the End of Life Assistance Scotland Bill in 2010. Uh, thank you very much for your written submissions. Uh, I say to the Law Society, my goodness, I was ages reading it. <laughs> and I, the faculties was much shorter, and somebody rather adeptly said, because time is money to the faculty, and that's why it was crisp. I thank the, the Human Rights Commission for theirs as well. Anyway, so because we've got those, uh, we can go straight to questions. As it just put, you indicate to me, you go on my lists. Sandra, I'll put you on my list just to show I'm not vengeful. And um, I'll have Elaine, then Roddy, and then um, I'll have uh, Christian. Thank you. And then Patrick. Off we go. Sandra first, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, convener. Now you see, you get yes, it first yes, and you're that's, not ready. That's off a Monday morning, or Tuesday morning, sorry. <laughs> Do you know what day it is? Uh, thank you very much and, and uh, good morning. Uh, I must say, I thank you all very much for your submissions. Um, very enlightening for, for myself as not having a legal background, I must admit. I think it took me about two days to read through all of it. Uh, anyway, this morning included. The first question I wanted to ask was in regards to the role of solicitor as proxy. And you have stated that we are the view that solicitors should not undertake this proxy function. And you mentioned the Belgian model. Perhaps could you elaborate more on that particular aspect? Of I think it? that's from Ms. Riddle. And by the way, if you just indicate to me that you wish to answer a question, if not specifically directed at you, I'll, I'll, I'll call you and your um, microphone should come on automatically. The wee red light comes around. That's it on. That lets you know you're broadcasting, OK? So don't sure. say anything untoward you don't want recorded. Absolutely, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, yes, that probably does sit with me. And I suppose, more broadly, I think it's not a sense that solicitors should not necessarily act as proxy, but the challenge, I think, that the bill presents is that what looks like a very systemised process, actually underlying that are some very significant professional obligations that I think potentially bring into conflict some of the duties of a solicitor, whereas what the Belgian model does, and I've got some of the the provisions here is it doesn't necessarily require a solicitor so it does anticipate a requirement where a person may need physical or mechanical aid but it and identifies someone who perhaps understands the process better perhaps understands the medical condition and it does require a medical certificate the difficulty i feel for a solicitor is that while solicitors on an everyday basis will act as a notary or act as an agent what section 16 of, of the bill provides is something other and something beyond what is currently reflected in the legislation. I talked a little bit about the 1995 Act and that anticipates, again, I had a look at the annotated commentary around that bill previously, that anticipates really just a mechanical aid and it didn't anticipate this kind of assessment of capacity. And again, you might say, well, solicitors assess capacity um, every day as well. But for me, the clear distinction is that they don't assess capacity in such a, a different and such a significant outcome as assisted suicide would be. 
um, the decision here is going to be irreversible and terminal, and I think that's what the challenge is for a solicitor. They wouldn't ordinarily have the training, the experience, mm -hmm. or the knowledge to be able to assess whether a person really did understand the effect of that. Yeah. Why should that be any different? Why should it be different what's being decided? I mean, if it's a contractual matter, let's say, a solicitor has to, and signs his proxy, and makes an assessment as to capacity. Why should it be any different because the decision is about how one ends one's life or just entering a court? It's, it's a matter of capacity. It is, but I think it introduces really significant ethical and moral um, interests into this beyond a solicitor looking at you know, a transaction or a conveyancing sale. And a solicitor, I don't think, generally would have the experience. I also think because you're bringing a solicitor into this process, you have to give some regard to the professional obligations they have, so obligations to only act in areas where they're competent and, er and an obligation to act in a client's best interest. And I think that's the huge moral dilemma here, to assess whether it is in a client's best interest and whether a solicitor is the appropriate person to make that decision. You touched on what you were saying yourself, Kevin, I'd written down about ethics and and uh, obviously the moral obligations. You op open up another field in that respect then. If the bill was to pass with this part of the legislation intact, would solicitors therefore uh, be obliged to be the, the person uh, if they morally or ethically didn't feel they could do that? A solicitor would be in a position to not to accept the instructions right. and not to act, so that would be a safeguard. I think the concern for me and the need to address it now is rather than have a position where the bill went through, because this is untested within the profession, so we don't know how the profession would react to this, there may well be solicitors who are well qualified and well trained who could deal with this, for example, those who work in the sphere of mental health law. But I think your average solicitor is not likely to come across this kind of situation. The guidelines, I think, anticipate potentially 27 requests annually so it's not the kind of area that's going to build up potentially frequent requests and experience. I'll leave it at that just now. I, I, I don't want to follow up on that. So I want to follow up again. With somebody, it's a will, um, you know, and, and it's a very important decision. And it might be a, a, something that's a rather strange will to make, perhaps, counter that. This solicitor can either say, well, you know, I, I don't want to say, not take your instructions, or take them having assessed capacity. I'm kind of still not convinced that there's a distinction between capacity when someone's making a will, when the solicitor has to make a judgment and can say no if there's any doubt, and, um, you know, making a contract about life. Yes, I'll, I'll let Patrick, do you want to join in on that particular question? Uh, I'm very grateful, convener. Uh, I suppose that the question is whether this is interpreted as a medical assessment of capacity or a common sense test of, of understanding, which is common in, in other contexts. And, and you use the phrase, which is included in the, in the written submission as well, uh, that this is irreversible and terminal. Clearly, the act of ending uh, a person's life, a person ending their own life or someone assisting them to do so uh, is terminal and irreversible. But none of the three documents we're talking about here, the preliminary declaration, the first request or the second request, is irreversible. In fact, right throughout the bill, there are clear steps to ensure that these are all reversible. And it's, in fact, easier to cancel uh, each, each of these steps than to... Um, uh, than to take them take those steps in the first place. Uh, I, I wonder also if you could explain a slight um, ambiguity in your, your evidence. You suggest the Belgian model uh, on page two. Now that allows the proxy to be anyone of a minimum age who doesn't stand to gain from the person's death. But two pages later, you argue that the proxy should be a medical practitioner, which does seem odd given that each of these three documents, preliminary declaration, request one and request two, require already to be uh, approved by a medical practitioner, uh, including a, a, an assessment of capacity? Um, I think there's a couple of points. I think I suppose in terms of the... Um, sorry, just... I've slightly lost your two points there. Um, the last point... I mean, I mean, the first is that the, the, the three documents, the intention and the two other, can be revoked. They're not irreversible. Absolutely. And, where the bill to proceed as it is, what I would anticipate for solicitors would be enhanced guidance as we've got for solicitors who are acting, drawing up wills, powers of attorney and so on, where they do have the opportunity to seek guidance from a medical practitioner, because it is a significant responsibility. 
And I do think that the outcome of assessing a client's best interest in relation to something as significant as, as, as assisted suicide does distinguish it from some other transactions. I, 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 I don't know if I actually follow that either, Patrick, because you, elsewhere you say that if, if you give advice to a client and the client rejects that advice, the solicitor has the option of saying, you know, well, I think you should take advice elsewhere or saying, well, I've given you my advice, I've put it in writing, nevertheless, that's what you want, I will do it. Absolutely. And a, and so a what is, you know, you're making a judgment about the right of the person to make the decision about how they want to end their life. You're saying that could be, but it shouldn't be an issue for the solicitor if they're, surely, if they are, can, if they are satisfied that the person has capacity, then I cannot see the distinction, frankly, between that and other uh, times when the solicitor will act or the advocate will act as a proxy. I think, and there's an element of assumption on this, but some of the challenges might be around the condition that the person has, so how effectively that the, the relevant person can communicate. So a solicitor has a duty for effective communication, best interest of the client. If the solicitor doesn't know the person, hasn't met them before, and has to try and establish that relationship, that communication, and it may be that the person's not in a a position to communicate okay. verbally, so that's challenging. I think what I did notice in the guidelines within the bill is that for the other professions, there is a, a reflection for training and funding, but that isn't reflected for solicitors. And I think to protect solicitors and the public, it would be fair to see that reflected as that this is not something that necessarily every solicitor would be equipped or trained to assess, and it would require some further um, assistance and training there. Do you wish to pursue the proxy? Are we moving on? Um, do feel free. If, if, if you allow me, just one final point. I, I suppose the, the the point is certainly that uh, solicitors would be uh, entitled to uh, act as to proxy, act. but not or required to do so if they didn't feel that they could uh, meet that that what I would regard as a common sense test of the person understanding the effect of the document. But it still seems unclear to me what you're asking for. Whether you're proposing the Belgian model in which anyone who doesn't have an interest who's over a certain age can act as proxy or medical practitioners? Or would you simply be suggesting that we add medical practitioners but not remove the right of solicitors to, to do this uh, proxy role if they felt able to? I think it's a matter that does require medical assistance. And I think on reflection, since these submissions, it occurs to me that just because the requirement for a proxy isn't reflected within the actual bill, that doesn't lead necessarily to the conclusion that there isn't the opportunity, say, in another jurisdiction for a proxy to act. So, for example, that might be contained within common law or within other legislative provisions. So just because it's within... And it's arguable that whether Section 16 is, compared, is concluded within this bill would prevent someone from having a proxy act for them anyway because the provisions available within the 1995 <coughs> Act... But I suppose from, from the society's point of view, the concern is that solicitors don't have the experience or knowledge to make the assessment of capacity because they see it as a significant decision and therefore they'd be looking for medical training or assistance to do that. It does still imply a medical test of capacity, which I don't think is suggested in the text of the bill. We'll move on. We can come back to that if somebody wants to come back to that. Move on, Elaine. We can come back to these issues if you wish. It's one of the uh, differences you, you've pointed out in your evidence between the assisted dying bill in the UK <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me, in this bill is that there's a the assisted dying bill um, defines a maximum life expectancy of six months, whereas this bill refers to a terminal or life shortening illness. Now, a number of illnesses could be life shortening, but they, uh, there could be many years of the person's life uh, still remaining. Uh, and you also, in, I think the faculty, no, I think actually it's in the, the Law Society, makes the point that, in fact, some mental illnesses could be life-shortening, but they seem to be excluded by uh, Clause 12A, which just says that people should not be suffering from any mental disorder. So I just wondered if you could explore those issues a little more and what you know whether it's desirable to actually to define a, a maximum uh, life expectancy, or is that too difficult because actually detecting it? Two points difficult. in there yeah. is that the time and also this expression, mm. life shortening, mm. and the complexities of using that term. Who would like to take this? Quite happy professor. to. Professor, yes, Professor. Quite happy to try and answer your question there. I think in relation to placing a time on a terminal illness, I think that's a very, very difficult thing to do. All illnesses manifest in different ways. 
and trying to be precise about that. I think we would be probably more sensible trying to ascertain why we were doing that. What value would it have to place a time limit on a terminal illness at that point? Um, in relation to mental illness and disease, other jurisdictions have taken the view that what somebody with a mental illness can request assistance to die. And in the Netherlands, that has already been forthcoming. Um, the provisions in this bill have not taken us down that road at that time in the interest of protecting those who may lack capacity to make decisions at that time, have vulnerability. Our legal system places great responsibility on the state's obligation to protect life, particularly when it is vulnerable. And I believe that's the reasons it's reflected in the bill just now. Yeah. I mean, you don't actually... There's no particular problem. I mean, I know this has been flagged up. And you don't actually see a, a problem with the way in which this bill is written at the moment in terms of those... In terms of... In terms of, of, of the, well, the terminology about a terminal or life shortening, because both, I think both the faculty and the Law Society flagged this up. Yes. And I, I wondered if you're actually flagging this up as an relation, issue or just... In relation to duration, mm. I, I hope I've, I've already answered yes, the point yeah, I, there. I, I accept that's um, very, very difficult I to think define. in terms of whether it's life shortening and tractable, I think placing any clear definition, it's very, very difficult to do. It's clearly a subjective decision in every case. And I don't think it's only definitions of life shortening which may be mm. problematic. I think there can be many definitions throughout the bill. It's very, very difficult to place a subjective or indeed objective definition mm. on there. But would you agree, or, or is it your view that the bill is correct in the way in which this is done, or could it be improved? I mean, is, is this ter terminology as good as it can get, I, or, is, or, or are there ways it could be improved? I think we would always look for clarity, given the implications of any outcomes um, of the provisions of the bill, trying to make these as clear as it's possible mm. to be would always be advantageous, not only for the individual wishing to use its provisions, but for those being able to interpret it as well. But is the, clear, the bill as clear as it could be? I think it could be clearer. And in what way do you think it could be clearer? Then? I think definitions on life shortening could You could won't actually want to see clearer. those in the face of the bill. Yes, and I think also that's a medical decision, not a legal one. The, the, the law would be guided in relation to what the definition of life shortening would be within a medical context. You've not got a handy amendment with you then. <laughs> not does, today. Does, does anybody have one? What about the faculty? I think you had concerns about life shortening. Yes, uh, the faculty has concerns about the way that uh, this is defined, but I think it is worth noting as well that in addition to having a life shortening condition or illness or a terminal life, uh, a t terminal um, illness or condition, the person would also have to uh, be able to show that they had a quality of life which was unacceptable. So it isn't merely sufficient for the purposes of the bill that a life shortening condition exists. It has to have a current impact on the quality of life. And that may go some way towards um, restricting what otherwise a fairly general uh, provision in relation to... Isn't that fairly subjective condition. as well, to say that the quality of life is unacceptable, because what might be acceptable to one individual would not be acceptable to another? So is that not slightly unclear Yes, as well? there's a subjective element, mm. but then in the certificates that require to be signed by the medical practitioner, they have to confirm that um, there is nothing known to them which is factually inconsistent with the conclusion that the quality of life is unacceptable. So... Uh, I think perhaps it doesn't do to focus entirely on um, the, um, the, uh, phrase, uh, the, the phrases that are used in relation to the condition or illness. One has to take into account, too, that that's the first stage of a two-step uh, test, uh, and therefore it's qualified by the second stage, the second step. I'll come back. You want to come back, Roderick? Can I refer, first of all, to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, I'd just like to kind of expand further on issues of clarity and definitions, perhaps just taking it a stage further back, though, to the question of whether or not the bill would be improved by a definition of a sui assisted suicide on it. Will the panel think about that. Yes, Professor. I think there is a very strong need 
for clarity on what constitutes assistance in suicide. Um, and in danger of repeating myself, I, I agree that's a very, very difficult thing to be able to grasp. The bill refers in its, uh, I think it's its explanatory notes, this idea of a licensed facilitator to provide reassurance but not encouragement, just to take one example. And I think it would be very difficult to know at what point the provision of reassurance stops and active encouragement starts. Many of the cases that have discussed these issues of assistance to die have been brought to the courts by people with progressive neurological disease, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, etc. And, and for them, the issue of assistance is very intense. And they envisage a time when their capacity is still there, but their physical ability to be able to assist, um, sorry, to take their own life is no longer there. So at what point putting pills in somebody's hands, holding up their head to allow them to ingest tablets, the demarcation lines are by no means clear. And given the responsibility, a facilitator or whoever is assisting that death, it has to be very clear where assistance stops and one being complicit in homicide actually starts. Anybody else wish to comment? Yes, please. I mean, uh, accepting the point, that, that, uh, there, is, there is also the other end of the, the chronological spectrum <laughs> where, for example, somebody is prescribing the drugs that they know are to be taken in order to bring the death about. Now, is that part of the assistance and is it covered by the bill? So th there is an enormous chronological potential scope of coverage of this bill from the initial act by people who simply do what is necessary to allow the process to take place, the dispenser, the prescriber, to the person who perhaps hands over the pills at the end of life and provides the, the glass of water. Roderick, do you want to? Well, <clears throat> perhaps, you yeah, know, I'd just like perhaps to engage with uh, Professor Miller. I saw you shaking. Can you shake. move on to something else just but now? Just on this point. OK, yeah, thank you, because basic, I know that John I know that in. you, you were shaking your head at the question of being drawn on the definition of suicide. That we're having a, a assisted suicide. We're having a second panel representatives of uh, the Crown and Police later on. I noticed in your submission, uh, you're saying because uh, we don't have a definition of uh, uh, or it's not criminal and under Scots law for any um, uh, for for a charge of uh, suicide um, to be brought. But um, you state there's no means of knowing how prosecuting authorities might respond to a relative who assisted the death of another individual um, because we don't have a, a definition in law. Would you like to just expand on that that issue whilst you're here? Yes, um, thank you very much. And like many of you, I have fond memories of discussing this issue with, with Margot over the years. Um, and it is very strange to be now be discussing it um, without her. And it is a challenging issue. Um, from a human rights point of view, and, and sort of beginning to zero in on uh, the question, you actually have a relatively free hand, in a sense, in that human rights law neither requires you or prevents you from legislating on assisting suicide. It, there's no consensus around Europe. It's up to each country to have its public debate, its parliamentary um, decision uh, on it. If you do decide and Parliament does not um, approve this bill, then there is a problem that has to be tackled, uh, and that is the lack of foreseeability, the lack of accessibility for individuals and families to know just what actions that they may want to take um, informally to assist suicide, um, will that lead to criminal sanctions being brought against them? There was the, the case uh, in the UK Supreme Court recently of Purdy where it decided that there was a lack of accessibility, a lack of foreseeability in the criminal law and the DPP had to issue quite detailed directions that people had a better understanding of of where they were in, in a, a grey situation. And there is ripe um, conditions, I think, for a, a challenge in Scotland for the, the lack of that at present in the current system. Otherwise, an individual simply doesn't know if they're going to be breaching the law or not. 
Uh, they're in a very difficult emotional set of circumstances, and the last thing they need is a lack of clarity about what their legal position is. So in that sense, having a go at uh, legislation, uh, difficult there may be, does have a positive um, case uh, rather than relying on guidance from prosecuting authorities? Well, anything that makes it clear that individuals know where they stand, um, that can be done whether you pass this legislation or not. Um, what I'm saying is if you decide not to, then there still remains something that has to be addressed uh, quite apart from this bill. Mm. Thank you. John, you want to come in, and yeah. then Patrick on Thank this you. issue. Thank it, you. It's a question for uh, Professor Miller, and, and you alluded to the Purdy case, Professor Miller, and in your evidence there, uh, in a footnote, you talk about the concern the Commission has that there's a lack of guidance relating to the mission doctrine, uh, whereby doctors may withdraw life-sustaining treatment and certain knowledge that this will bring about the death of a patient. I wonder if what we can learn from the arrangements that are applied at the moment from a human rights point of view about the withdrawal, or I mean, even there's instances of where people make an undertaking not to be resuscitated. Mm. Uh, what, what can we learn for this debate from these two issues? Well, I think um, whether, whether this legislation is passed or not in, in this or any other form, there is a need to recognise the right to improve palliative care in Scotland um, for reasons that are obvious. Otherwise, if, if, if we're not looking after people the way we should be, then they are going to be placed in situations where they're going to say, well, is this, is this worth carrying on? So I think there's an obligation, irrespective of the, the merits of this bill, to improve palliative care. Part of that is recognising uh, the human right to the highest attainable standard of health. That applies to older persons as much as it does to people in any other stage of life. And there is concern that there are practices that are not recognising that right um, of those in need of care and health decisions being made that respects their free will to determine what kind of health care they're going to be given. Uh, I know from, from my personal experience, and I'm sure that others around the table too, this is not what's done on a daily basis in hospitals. Decisions are being made without proper consent, instructions, information, the free will being exercised by the patient herself. And very often families have been put in a situation where they're making decisions that they're ill-equipped to make for emotional reasons, for, for legal reasons, as we discussed before. So there is a need for much more certainty um, for families and for medical and legal professionals. Um, I, I, I would agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you John. Patrick. Um, and then, uh, sorry, after Patrick, I've got uh, Christian. Patrick. Thank you, convener. I, I suppose it's just to pick up on some of the points that uh, Professor Miller has made and, and perhaps ask one or two of the other witnesses to, to respond to it. There's questions of clarity, questions of definition, uh, for example, around uh, what counts as reassurance and what would step beyond that, uh, what counts as assistance. Uh, the, 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 the seeking of, of clarity is understandable, but this is clearly a complex Area. There will always be difficult concepts involved, uh, and it seems to me that the provision of uh, the guidance that would flow from this legislation, for example, about the training and responsibilities of uh, licensed facilitators, um, even the context for, uh, for someone who had not requested assisted suicide or not made a preliminary, preliminary declaration would leave medical uh, practitioners in a clearer sense, uh, it, for example, in some of the, the, the decisions that Professor Miller was alluding to, that someone had not given this indication, and that gives uh, some sense. It seems to me that the, the questions of clarity you're, you're seeking um, are open-ended questions at present, uh, and this legislation uh, gives us the clearest opportunity to begin to fill in the gaps, uh, particularly through the guidance for the, the role of facilitators. Is that something you would agree with? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I was giving them a moment, to Patrick, to gather the thoughts after that peroration. So, uh, My point of view, my concern would be that there would be a danger of individuals falling through the gaps and finding themselves exposed due to the uncertainty to prosecution. 
Now, the reality at, at present in Scotland seems to be that there is very little in the way of historic prosecution of those who have assisted suicide. There are very few cases. We don't have a statutory offence such as they have in England, which is the focus of prosecution there. Uh, but if the bill is introduced and cases are being scrutinised, as they will have to be uh, when a, if a system is introduced, then it seems to me if we don't get it or you don't get it right, then it's individuals who will suffer. Uh, and it would be better to get it right now rather than to get it right through a process of uh, a series of criminal prosecutions in the High Court where individuals are at risk of losing liberty. Certainly better to get it right than to get nothing. Yes. Thank you. Would it not assist then, because it's called the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill, to have a definition that people involved in this at all levels could understand? And if the answer to that is yes, will you provide one? <laughs> I want faculty QC advice free. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's a first. <laughs> Well, I, I currently don't have one. I mean, it would be silly to try and make one up. On the spot, uh, I understand. Spot. But it is possible, is it? Well, it, it should be possible. Um, it should be possible to define the circumstances which are covered by the bill in much the same way that Lord Faulkner's bill in England, which is different in yes. the system it, sets, it, it seeks to set up, uh, defines more clearly what is to be um, legalised and what is now to be permissible. So I would... I would have thought it can't be beyond the wit of man. Um, and that would be helpful to Mr Harvey, would it? Despite, if, depending on what that definition turns out to be, would you? I shouldn't be questioning you, you're not giving evidence. <laughs> uh, you can do that another time. Um, not quite yet. But, it, it, I mean, this seems to be part of the problem for everybody, is to know that they're within some kind of parameters. Yes. Right. Um, Christian, followed by um, Alison, please. Good morning. Um, I would like uh, um, to ask, first of all, a pointed question, then maybe a more general question. The first question would be on savings. Uh, I, I, was, I was surprised when I read it, uh, your views of both the uh, Law Society and uh, the advocates, uh, the faculty, about as uh, uh, the section 24 of the bill that provides saving provision for certain mistakes and things done in good faith. And both of you uh, pointed out that it, could, it might expose a person to the risk of prosecution. And uh, uh, you would uh, uh, suggest that uh, that should be, uh, should be changed. Could you elaborate maybe a bit on what you mean? Happy to uh, start with that. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. The savings for certain mistakes, I think we're almost back into a discussion for clarity. I think it's as soon as you start to uh, include sections such as this, you leave room for a broad range of practices, whether they're actions or omissions there. And for anybody being involved in this process, being left in this, in this vacuum, being uncertain as to what they have done or have not done may render them criminally liable, is probably not the best situation to be in. It's almost a catch-all provision um, which, whilst on one hand trying to have enabling or flexible legislation to deal with the complexities and the moral, personal and legal issues that this brings, leaving somebody in an uncertain state until some other subsequent mechanism comes in may not be the best way forward at this time. Yeah, I was particularly interested about uh, it, it's possible that the ignorance of the law would be a defence in relation to this bill. Say that again, sorry? The, the, but the ignorance of the law could be a defence in relation to, the, to this bill if people are prosecuted. Yeah. I think... Um, Ignorance of the bill could not be a defence at that time. Yeah. It absolutely could not. The law tends to state what becomes a crime um, and it would not be a defence to say what would be ignorance of the law. But I think it's more... One may not know what, what they may have to do in terms of assistance or actions or reassurance 
And until you're actually in that situation, it would be very difficult to be able to measure your responses at that time. Um, the nature of what one would be required to do in these situations might not give you that latitude. And you end up being in a situation where only afterwards you're actually having to try and account or respond to what you'd actually done or not done in those circumstances. Would the faculty would like to? Yeah, so I, I think there are a number of concerns from the faculty's point of view in the savings section. The, the first is that there is a considerable blunting of the uh, essential requirements set out earlier um, in the Act um, uh, by the effect of Section 24. Uh, I don't think that in itself that's necessarily a bad thing because this is a complicated system and you don't want to um, uh, expose people who have made simple errors uh, to prosecution. Uh, if you set up a complicated system, people will make mistakes. Uh, and therefore, it would seem to me that there has to be some means of preventing these people from being prosecuted. But whether the balance has been struck properly here, personally, I would doubt. What we're trying to do is prevent people who assist suicide being prosecuted for either murder or culpable homicide. And for example, in section 24, to make the test as to whether they are exposed to prosecution or not, ultimately one of carelessness on their part strikes me as being uh, a, a best unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, dividing line between um, a prosecution for murder uh, and a legalized assisted suicide here potentially is one of carelessness. Now, we're all careless from time to time. Um, and is that to be the test of whether somebody uh, is at risk of going to jail uh, and having a life sentence for murder? So I, I would have thought that this section, the savings section, needs to be looked at uh, again um, uh, and perhaps with rather tighter definitions even if we're told what care this is to be, against what standard of care um, it is to be measured, is it to be the standard of care um, of the ordinary reasonable man or, or um, the medical practitioner um, involved on a day-to-day -day basis in the assisted suicide process or some other standard? I feel really we have to be told. <coughs> Thanks very much. Uh, I may to ask a general it question. You're from civil liability, which it should does, be a lesser yes, test. Yes. yes. I mean, let, let's say that somebody is given uh, pills to end their life and it is unsuccessful, that, but they're left severely brain damaged and no longer in a position to exercise any subsequent decision to kill themselves. Uh, and at a relatively young age, uh, has no ability to earn income uh, and has uh, care requirements for the rest of their life? Uh, are they to have no remedy against the person who has negligently given them the wrong medication or uh, medication of insufficient strength? Thank you. I don't know if that's helpful, but I was just thinking as an aside, I think one should also consider the consequences of any um, sanction. In England, under the Suicide uh, Act, you have a sanction of 14 years imprisonment and the sanction of having assisted in a suicide. Um, as Scots law currently stands, it could be life and the title, if you like, of having committed murder or culpable homicide. So the consequences for those who are sanctioned under Scots law as it currently stands are very serious indeed. Let me ask a, 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 another question, another detailed question. You spoke about, uh, uh, as a faculty post, about um, um, pills. And I've seen a, a lot of um, uh, uh, evidence uh, given by, by both the law society and, and the faculty about the lack of clarification of when, what type of pills should be administered, who should decide. Uh, uh, how they should be administered, and particularly the timetable as well. There is no, uh, there is no indication in the bill to say when this pill should be uh, sh should be given back. So it seems to be a huge omission of how these pills uh, are used and how they should be used. Yes. 
Um, I can't speak to the pharmacology uh, of, of any pills being administered, but we did raise concerns that if any form of prescription is, is stored in someone's personal safe. home, um, how is that going to be um, looked after, ensuring it's safe? There could be other persons in the house there. And if this medication is or is not used, there's a stipulation that 14 days afterwards this has to be removed um, from from the person. Um, how would that be achieved? You know, would somebody just immediately take it away? Would someone be knocking on the doors a matter of hours later? And we cannot lose sight that any legislation that is passed has to consider the individual. That's the person at the centre of any any legislation that we pass. If they haven't taken the medication, perhaps they, if they need another hour, two hours. Is that going to be given to them or is it going to be very strictly enforced? If it is going to be enforced, how, how would that actually happen there? Professor, you want to come in? Yeah. Thanks, Convener. Uh, the Commission didn't make a submission on any of these issues, but, but they are, I find them very, very interesting in the, the line that you're, you're taking. And um, at the risk of maybe having not seen something in the bill that's there, I no doubt I'll be corrected if that's the case. But in terms of, of mistakes and, and the savings, um, from a human rights point of view, you want to try and ensure that as far as possible, the opportunity for making mistakes is reduced as far as it possibly can be, whilst recognising you can never eliminate um, it in its entirety. And the real test from human rights point of view is, did the person exercise free will? And was the decision made um, based on sufficient information to be able to be satisfied that this person who is seeking to bring an end to their life is doing so uh, with free will. And, I mean, I've heard discussion about capacity has to be uh, tested, and of course uh, the medical condition has to be satisfied. But also, if, you know, if my background is legal, but if I were a legal or a medical professional being asked on behalf of society to affirm that this seemed to be okay um, for this person to end their life. I'd want to be satisfied that I had all the relevant background information so that I was satisfied there was no other pressures being brought to bear um, for whatever reason on this individual who may have the capacity, may have a medical condition, but is he or she really expressing a free will? And now, they may well be, but I'd want to be very satisfied that if there was anything lurking in the, in the undergrowth that I, I knew about that before I would make a decision. Uh, and, and we all know that these kinds of circumstances, without overstating how often that would happen, it only has to happen once. Um, and, and that is the most serious mistake that could be uh, contemplated. If I may, yes, a general question, and, and I know it's difficult to answer at this stage, but uh, we talked a lot about clarity and uh, the, draft, the draft of this bill seems to, to lack of clarity. So is it only a matter of having some amendments? Or we talked a lot about uh, of, uh, the volume of omission, uh, which is not in this bill, but uh, different uh, people brought evidence to say that there is a, 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 a lot of omission in the bill and a lot, a lot more should be drafted. So uh, that volume of omission, I don't know if it can be uh, uh, addressed by, by amendments and maybe we should think about uh, as a bill should be redrafted altogether because there is too much, <laughs> too much, not enough clarity and, and too, much, too many omissions. I know it's difficult this time to judge on this, but I would like to have your, your point of view. Um, as uh, representing the Law Society, we would not be in a position to comment on um, the aims and purposes of the bill. Um, we confine ourselves to, to looking at legal and practical issues as they arise. What, forgive me, I think that's what Christian was making yeah. point of. Yeah. We're, we're not dealing with the ethics here, but really mm -hmm. are the processes or the definitions lacking, so much lacking in the me mechanisms, as it were, and the legal tests. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry. I think just if, if I can comment, I think something that initially drew me to the bill was I think it is set up very much as a what intends to be a dignified, systematic process. And I think there's something to be said about the sort of simplicity and the, the directness that's been set up. But the challenges I think we've seen within the society is that as you start to probe beneath that, you do start to understand that the absence of definitions doesn't give the certainty, doesn't provide the simplified, process-driven intention that I think the, the bill seeks to, 
is seeking to achieve. So whilst we haven't necessarily got all the answers and the definitions, I think by enhancing the bill with that clarity and certainty, I think it would take a, a step further to being effective. That's amendment. Mm -hmm. That's amendment then, enhancing. I would have thought for the bill to be effective, it would, it would require that, because I think the yes. key to this is certainty. Does anyone else wish to comment on that, whether it's... Right. Um, I've got Alison, followed by Margaret, followed by Patrick. Thank you. Um, the bill doesn't contain any sanctions or penalties for any contraventions of, of, of its provisions, and I, I wonder if the panel have a view on that. I, I suspect that's because... Uh, the approach is not to create any offences, but to uh, uh, to uh, give uh, 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 freedom from mm -hmm. the risk of prosecution for common law offences yeah. which stand outside the bill. And uh, uh, an alternative approach would be to take the sort of approach that was taken in the English uh, Suicide Act 1961 and to decriminalise um, assisted suicide subject to specific offences created in the bill. That's not the approach which is currently taken. Um, and so I, I think that must, that mm -hmm. must be why, because of the, mm -hmm. um, the, the approach that has been taken in the drafting and structuring of the bill. Okay. Um, uh, just, come just, as well. yes. just a very, very small part. I think it's quite interesting that the provisions of Section 1 of the proposed bill is unusual in so far as it defines what is not yeah. a crime yeah. Yeah. as yeah. opposed to what is a crime. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the faculty in its written submission did, did think that it would be um, desirable to have, have, have some penalties. Do you want to um, discuss that further? Well, uh, you, you, that, I think it would be capable of looking again at the savings provision mm -hmm. uh, and instead of throwing people back onto the criminal law of murder and culpable homicide, uh, to uh, say, well, if you don't get this right, even if maybe you are a wee bit careless, yeah. uh, then you could be subject to punishment, but punishment under the bill and not uh, mm -hmm. simply the common law. Um, a matter, I suppose, of degree, what mm -hmm. sort of error you've made. So, well, and I have a separate of course, question. Of course, uh, back to the facilitators, the idea of the licensed facilitators. I note that um, the legislation as drafted at the moment suggests that anyone over the age of 16 um, could, could take on that role. Um, I think that that's rather young. Um, is there, uh, did the panel agree with that? I, I would certainly say that that's it. <coughs> that seems to be young. When considering the purpose that they are undertaking, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't know if this is a legal point, but it, um, one would hope that they would have an experience of life, a certain empathy to be able to understand the circumstances in which another individual may find themselves to be in. And um, whilst many 16-year-olds may feel <laughs> that they possess those qualities, uh, they would more usually be found in someone um, of older years. Mm -hmm. On, on the question of facilitator, in that section 21, um, par, uh, section 21, subsection 1, um, a licensed facility may not act as such for a person in relation to whom the facilitator is disqualified under Schedule 4. And I know you raised this in the submissions that at Schedule 4, 2G, anyone who will gain financially in the event of the person's death, whether directly or indirectly, and whether money or money is worth, well, you might not know that. That, that is an issue. I mean, you really don't always know whether or not you're in somebody's will. Is there an issue there, or would the, would the fact of, uh, you know, not knowing be sufficient? Because I know it was raised in the submissions. Yes. I mean, I think it would come down... To, it, it, it's not tested, so ignorance may not be a defence. It would really have to just be tested against the facts and circumstances the capacity that you acted and whether in fact you weren't you weren't aware of that i mean that that provision actually gives rise to another issue of a solicitor's proxy because a solicitor we're back to that you, know. <laughs> you weren't happy with me yes <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna just it's a very small point um, but as a, a solicitor might in fact be an executor you know for uh, a person in their will so that's that would 
exclude them from acting as a proxy. So a solicitor would in fact know that, but it does it does provide. Yes, you, would, think, you, you wouldn't do it if you're an executor. But, but it does create further tension about the different responsibilities and roles. And I think going back to your previous point, people are not going to necessarily be aware. They're going to feel uncomfortable asking. Have they, well, and, and their solicitor won't be able to disclose whether they're likely to benefit from anything from the will. So it does create just more uncertainty. Except surely the executor would have sight of the will. The executor would. So but you if, would if know a member if you're of a the family were to find out whether to know whether they could act as proxy or not, or if they're going to yeah. benefit, they, that couldn't be disclosed. I'm not going to dwell on this. I don't. I, I think yeah, I still don't agree on, with you. It. But there we are. Um, but uh, so that's not a huge issue, though. The fact that someone might not know they were going to benefit financially and they'd been a facilitator. It must put a certain unease in people who are yeah. facilitators if they think they're going to be placed in a position of scrutiny, particularly if we go on to the next section about police reporting and so on. Mm -hmm. so is it something we should bother about? I suppose we have to look to the, the, what the actual purpose of that is, which is to try and prevent abuse. Yes, So course. most of these would be judged upon after the event yes in terms of as um, as, as, as uh, mr zell says in terms of of knowledge or perhaps the amount that one would tend to benefit from but it's really probably not to pick up um a, an acknowledgement a um a thank you a bequest there it, it's really to prevent abuse which rarely is picked up until after the event i appreciate that perhaps mm. a statement by the party yeah. stating that the facilitator is not a benef beneficiary in any respect mm -hmm. if that was able to be done yes. that would feel be belt and braces for a facilitator yes. um margaret good morning um, I wonder if um, the panel could comment on the capacity issue and the variation and inconsistency between the, the bill and how capacity is defined in other legislation. Perhaps the Law Society and the faculty particularly, I think, has yes, a submission on that. Um, section 12 of the bill that deals with capacity uh, and it, uh, it, it, uh, it, 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 it has a sort of dual uh, approach, two-stage approach. A uh, person's capacity to make a request if they're not suffering from any mental disorder as defined um, um, in terms of the Mental Health Care and Treatment, uh, Scotland Act 2003, uh, which might affect the making of the request, so there's a qualification, um, and then is also capable of um, making a decision, communicating the decision, understanding the decision, and retaining the memory of the decision. And, and these are, um, this is the sort of reverse of the definition of incapable in the Adults with Incapacity Act uh, 2000. Um, and the... Um, the, the effect of the first part of, well, firstly, it's not clear, at least the faculty, why the decision has been taken to sort of yoke these two different sources together. Uh, if what is important is to determine whether an individual has capacity to make a decision. The first of the two uh, stage test, the uh, requirement that not be suffering from a mental disorder, uh, would exclude anybody with a mental illness, for example. Whether that mental illness was the principal focus of their desire to uh, have assisted suicide or was just incidental. Now, it must be I would have thought common for someone who believes their life is of an unacceptable quality due to a physical illness such as Parkinson's or MS or any of the other progressive uh, neurological illnesses to become depressed uh, and therefore to develop a mental illness. We don't usually assume that everyone who has a mental illness of whatever severity is incapable from making decisions. And yet, that seems to be what the bill is setting out to uh, establish. And that may be because whoever drafted it uh, or uh, Margaret MacDonald were very keen 
to be seen to exclude people who were mentally ill. But I, I think the effect of that is, the, the consequence of that is really one which the committee might want to consider in some detail. Is it really the intention that all of those who have any degree of mental illness are to be excluded from the provisions uh, of the bill? Yeah, I suppose the difficulty for us, we're the Justice Committee, so we're only yes. looking at you know, yeah. what we can put down legally without yes. um, really going into the medical consequences, but uh, I suppose it's the short-term nature of, of depression still being termed mental, mental health issue. Um, and maybe having a reversal in you know, how you might feel about something at another time, I think that goes to the heart of, of this particular um, provision. I, I was wondering, just returning to the 14-day time limit between issue of um, prescription and the act of suicide, I think a number of, if I've understood that properly, submissions um, express some concern about that and certainly they felt that maybe that was too short a time li limit and there might be pressure on the individual. Uh, certainly in Oregon, the Death with Dig Dignity Act, Act figures show that just over a third of people who initially get prescriptions change their mind to and choose to extend their, their life. So... Do you have any comments on, on that? I know there's three-stage protests, but we're talking at the very last hurdle here. Thank you. In, yes, some, quite a lot of studies have been done in, in Oregon that it had been shown that once the person knew that the option of assistance with death was available to them, they almost took a step back, they made other plans, some went on to actually utilise those provisions and, and others did not. Um, whilst on the one hand, I know we've been arguing for clarity, it's such a difficult thing to measure. It's trying to get a balance on the one hand that these are very difficult times for the individual. There are things that he or she may not want to achieve at that time. You do not want to, to rush them in any way. So trying to place a time limit, is, it's a very arbitrary thing. Some people will need a great deal of time. Others may not have that time due to their, the, the nature of their illness and infirmity. Um, so it's probably like most things, trying to get a balance. But I think if one would err on the side of protecting um, the, the individual's life, we would want to make sure that a decision made is fully informed, requisite time has been given to that individual to, to make that decision there. Anyone else want to come in? Mm -hmm. um, could I just return, convener, to, I don't know if licensed um, facilitators, did we hear if you thought that a definition of that should be in the, the bill? Or the function action taken by them should be actually in the, the bill? Yes? Just, I think, very brief point. I think it just goes back to, again, the, the, the roles and functions. This is, this is a new role, a new function that an individual will be undertaking. So, again, the clarity of what that role actually involves and the parameter of that role. Um, you're moving something that was originally very much the preserve of medical decision-making, clinical decision-making, and this role is being entrusted to another individual. Um, I think it has to be very, very clear what that role involves for them. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment on that one? I just endorse um, that point. In terms of Section 19, there's a number of points. Some have been made already about comfort and reassurance, such practical assistance as is reasonably requested. It's very difficult to know what, what that means and, and what the parameters are around that. So for a facilitator to undertake that responsibility, I think that would benefit from definition. Right. Could you put that on the face of a bill, or would you put it in some kind of guidance to it, facilitate us? I think it would inevitably be guidance, and the kind of thing that would probably develop <coughs> as practice and experience dictated the kinds of requests and, and assistance that, that, that was required. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Mom. Guidance, because I think I would feel very uncomfortable that just this role was being developed by ministers, you know, a crucial role, after, you know, we passed a bill. Um, uh, just again on the, the, the functions of licence facilitators, um, should there be a duty to record um, when, what was dispensed and then what, what happened thereafter? 
just a, a lot of tidying up around this very crucial role. They should know initially what was dispensed anyway, so the nature of the drug, how much was actually dispensed there. But I think it also takes it back, if the, the drug has not been used, you're back on this 14, you know, 14 days to, re to remove the drug, um, how is that going to be disposed of? Who has the responsibility? Does that go back to the pharmacist for that to be safely mm -hmm. disposed? Is it the responsibility of the licensed facilitator? And I keep thinking of the circumstances. You know, th this event has occurred. An individual um, has received assistance to end their life. The priority for the licensed facilitator may rest elsewhere other than worrying about what's happening to the pharmacology writing reports at that time. Would it be so onerous to um, have a duty to record when and, and what? Not does? at all. No. Um, I, I think it would be only right that that duty to record occurred, but at, I think, a reasonable time frame should be given for them to, re to make that uh, recording. I think the priorities, if they are there to be providing reassurance, would surely have to go to the individual concerned and or any next of kin family members at that time, but it would not be unreasonable to expect them to record what happened, yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Sandra, now, then I'll take Patrick last, and I'll let you be a sweeper up, as it were, <laughs> on all the things that you wish we'd asked or we didn't follow through. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you. thank you, convener. It was in regarding to the facilitator, and Margaret had asked a couple of the questions I wanted to ask. But basically, you know, concerns around, which everyone has, has put forward, around facilitator being appointed by government or ministers, uh, what experience, what is the role, basically, uh, that isn't written out in, in the face of the bill. And another question I wanted to ask, and it's in the back of Professor Miller's, if something uh, could happen, and I think uh, Mr Stevenson also said, if by chance a facilitator had you know, given the medicine and that person had uh, ended up you know, very much disabled, et cetera, et cetera, would uh, the chance be that a facilitator could actually be prosecuted for criminal negligence, if that wasn't written on the bill or if that wasn't part of, I don't know if you'd call it a contract or not, but it doesn't seem very clear what the role, it seems clear what the role of a facilitator is, but there's nothing in writing that protects anyone who may be a facilitator if any careless action happens. And I just wonder if that had to be looked at as well. I, I agree. Um, the role of the licence, we've already alluded to the question of age, mm. that, that 16 seems very young to have that experience. Now, some facilitators will come forward who may inevitably have some form of medical training, mm. medical experience, and others will not. So there will be a great diversity in terms of, in terms of experience um, between uh, each licence facilitator. So how they may manage mm. a certain situation when the individual who may be trying to ingest medication becomes in distressed, some may need to call for assistance from other, um, um, other medical sources. Others may have the ability um, to deal with the situation at that time. But it still brings you back to what form of assistance that may take. Mm -hmm. If you're then trying to make sure that the individual is ingesting substances with the least amount of distress... That certainly seems to me mm. to have perhaps crossed some line, certainly within the parameters as the bill stands just now. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I, I would say that your question is a very good one. <coughs> I don't actually have an answer. I would suggest that perhaps we ought to be able to find an answer in the bill, and present we don't. Can I point out, however, that although somebody has to uh, sign a declaration that they have arranged to have the services of a facilitator, if they, there is then no express requirement in the bill that the facilitator be involved. Mm -hmm. So if having made an arrangement to have a facilitator, booked a facilitator, if you like, somebody then says, well, in fact, I shan't bother, I won't have a facilitator, for whatever reason, there, there would seem to be nothing in the bill that would impose any consequence upon that. So this isn't a bill which, set to my mind, sets up a system that requires the assistance of a facilitator uh, when the uh, lethal drugs or the mm -hmm. lethal injection uh, are administered. And, and that perhaps a matter of concern. Mm -hmm. 
Perhaps this is a process which should have a form of compulsory supervision, mm. albeit one can see why individuals might not like that sort of intrusion at what would be one of the most personal moments in, in one's life for, uh, uh, for them and for their uh, friends and family. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You've a, a quick question, Elaine, for Very Patrick. I'd like to come in. Very quick query on, on because I think both the faculty and the Law Society have made, have commented on the fact that there's not a conscience clause in the bill. Would I be correct in, in assuming that that is not necessary since this bill defines what is not a crime and therefore if you refuse to take part in what is not a crime, you're not committing a crime, so therefore it is not necessary to uh, put a conscience clause into the bill? I'm not sure I um, have the knowledge to be able to, to answer that fully, but I would say that I would believe that a conscience clause addresses more than criminal liability. It's called a conscience clause because it addresses one's attitude towards their profession, their moral standing, their ethical beliefs and values. So I don't, I, I don't feel able to comment on the criminality aspect of it, but I, I think it definitely covers more than just criminal mm. behaviour. Mm. I, th I think it's more about certainty again. Certainly from the perspective of a solicitor, they would be able to choose not to act, as would any of the parties. But I think, and it's reflected in the assisted dying one, that there is, it's just clarity and certainty that you, this is an option you can elect to make. Mm. But practically, it wouldn't change somebody mm. whether they... But, because, they I mean, basically you're saying, I'm not prepared to take part in something which is not a crime. So you're not... Uh, there's no uh, oper yeah. you know, there's no chance of prosecution of the person who says I don't want to take part in it. Is yes, it? but if if you, um, for example, consider um, abortion legislation, mm. there's a conscience clause there. The primary consideration is not whether or not the individual is taking part in a crime; it's a personal preference whether or not they wish to be involved with the mm. termination of the pregnancy. Does does abortion or does the, you know, the abortion legislation take the same? Does it deal with the issue in the same way of saying that it's not a crime to do that, or is it actually making an exception from the, the, the alternative approach, which uh, Dave Stevenson has suggested for this bill, where you actually make an exception of something that is a crime, if you see what I mean? Uh, undertaken under the terms of the Act is not an offence, but if you don't comply with the Act, it remains an So it takes the, the alternative yeah. approach, does it? Yeah. 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 The, a conscience clause could have two purposes. It, it, it could allow people to say, I'm not prepared to participate in, in this. It could also then go on to require them to say why they were not participating so that the person who is seeking assistance uh, is referred on to somebody who knows the reason that they are being declined assistance. It is not because they do not meet the requirements of the Act. It is because the individual they have consulted has conscientious objection to involvement. Mm -hmm. And if you, in your conscience clause, as faculty have suggested, go on to say, if you're going to exercise your right of conscience, you must then also tell the person that that is the ground on which you are refusing them assistance. That enables them to understand yes. that they can go somewhere else and seek assistance from someone who does not have conscientious objection. So that would be a second purpose to a conscience uh, clause. Patrick, I'll let you know. Thank you very much, convener. Um, an, an awful lot of ground has been covered, uh, and I wonder if it might be appropriate if I was to write to the committee before you reach your conclusions to, to cover uh, some of the issues that there might not be time to cover. We are very flexible. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I think just to, to pick up on one or two of the, the issues that, that have been touched on, just briefly, the conscience clause. Uh, it's a, a great convenience uh, for those legislating in, in Westminster that they don't have to consider the question of devolved and reserved competencies. Uh, and perhaps if uh, at, at some future time there's a reciprocal legislative consent mechanism, we would have that, that flexibility as well. But clearly, I, I, I think there's a, a requirement for uh, the um, guidance, guidelines for professional bodies uh, to address the issue of a conscience clause. Would that be an appropriate means to do it, given that the regulation of medical professionals is not something we can legislate on in this parliament? Okay, thank you. Um, I think also the um, <coughs> the question of um, the age of the, the minimum age of uh, licensed facilitators being 16 um, is it not clear that uh, 
this is not simply a, a voluntary role which one steps up for and, and acquires that, that status. There is a licensing process which would be undertaken which would take into account uh, the, the skills and abilities or experience that people would require to undertake that role. Having said that, uh, it's, would it not seem reasonable that, for example, someone who might be very young but had been a full-time carer uh, for uh, a relative for a long time, perhaps for many years, uh, and would have gained the, the kind of experience uh, and a commitment to, to palliative care and to the, the de dignity and, and uh, freedom of choice of people at the end of their lives, that somebody who was surprisingly young might have that experience and might be regarded by the licensing body as an appropriate applicant. I, I, I agree. I think it's the quality of the, the person's experience and their ability to have an understanding um, of what they're about to undertake there. Yes. Thank you. Um, the, um, the question, I, I think, uh, around capacity and mental health uh, has perhaps been misunderstood. It, it's, it's clear to me uh, from the way that uh, this bill was, was drafted and subsequently I've, I've undertaken it that Section uh, 12.1a does not uh, rule out from the capacity test anyone uh, with a mental health diagnosis. It talks about uh, someone who is not suffering from any mental disorder within the context of the 2003 Act, which might affect the making of the request. Uh, is, is that not a, a, a clear uh, statement? This, this final clause in it is not a commentary on the nature of mental illness. It is part of the capacity test, uh, and that therefore as someone who had a, a diagnosis for a mental health condition which did not affect their capacity to, uh, to make that decision, to make that request, uh, would be able to make a request. Is that not clear? Well, uh, with respect, I, I don't think it is, because the, um, the last part of Section 12.1a uh, reads, which might affect the making of the request. It doesn't say which does affect the making of the request. Mm. It's, I suspect, in practice, very difficult to exclude the possibility that any mental disorder might affect the making of the request. It, it does seem to me that this is a, a, a capacity test that a, a, a medical practitioner with expertise in this field, having the responsibility to, to apply that test in, in approving the, uh, the, the, the request that had been made. Uh, you know, this, this is one of the, the normal things that they would be doing in, in applying that capacity test in other contexts. For example, someone who had uh, a, a history of a recurring uh, mental health condition which had not recurred for a long time, but they still had that diagnosis, uh, it would be reasonable to conclude that, that uh, uh, there having been no recurring episodes for a long time, that condition did not affect their ability to make the request. Well, that's possible, but you would have to exclude it as a possibility, and it would it, that, that decision would have to be made with someone with mm. the appropriate level of qualification. And one of the concerns that faculty had in our response in relation to capacity was that we wondered whether the, the way this was phrased wasn't driving one to the conclusion that the only person properly in a position to make this judgment would be a psychiatrist. I think the, the final question I would, I would put is a general one, convener, which applies to this matter as well as to the section on savings and to, and to sub, several other issues which have arisen over the, the course of the discussion. And it's about the balance between specificity uh, and flexibility or the ability to, to take account of circumstances uh, and to take account of, of case law, which uh, is required with or without legislation in this area. Um, the, 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 the question has been put several times that, that there's a, a need for greater clarity. So, so my response would be to ask, uh, is there, and uh, as the member in charge, I'll be happy to discuss amendments that are uh, constructive and intended to improve the bill, uh, very happy to do so. But is there not a danger that if we get into that kind of discussion, mm -hmm. at the other end of the, the spectrum, uh, an overly rigid approach uh, would also give rise to uh, problems in the application of the law uh, and problems in uh, an inability to take account of circumstances. This is surely a balance between clarity and an overly rigid approach. Is there not that, uh, that danger of going too far in the other direction? 
There must always be a, a balance to be struck, and there's an advantage to having a simple system for no other reason but that people can then understand it, people who are not lawyers or people who are not uh, regularly engaged in the process of considering assisted suicide. Um, I, I, I would suggest that clarity does not necessarily involve complexity. So, for example, if one looks at Lord Faulkner's bill um, for England and Wales, it, it, it seems to me that it's more clearly, as a lawyer, it's more clearly expressed, and I, I think I understand it more easily uh, than I do when I look at this bill. So, and, and yet, it's no longer than this bill. I think, in fact, it's shorter. Thank, well, you, thank, thank, you, thank you very much. I want to thank the witnesses. A very interesting um, issue to explore. And thank you for your evidence. Can I say to Patrick, because we're the secondary committee, you won't actually be coming in front of us. Indeed. Uh, but it's open to members, notwithstanding the fact that health and sports sit at the same time as us, that if you wanted to attend, you could ask health and sport to go along if legal issues were arising. Because I, I suspect you'll be before the health and sport committee giving evidence, and then you could question uh, Patrick on issues arising. But that's... Uh, that's if you don't want to be here on our happy hunting ground. Uh, can I thank you very much? I'm going to suspend for five minutes for the next panel of witnesses. OK, thank you.
Uh, let's just uh, start up again, please. Thank you. Uh, I welcome to uh, meeting our second panel of witnesses on the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill, Chief Superintendent Gary Flanagan, Head of Major Crime Specialist, Crime Division of Police Scotland, and Stephen McGowan, Procurator Fiscal, Major Crime and Fatalities Investigation, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And as I said with the earlier panel, I thank you for the submissions. And so we'll go straight to questions from members. And Elaine, Margaret, John. Um, the bill is drafted uh, to define something as not being a crime uh, and, uh, under uh, a variety of circumstances. Does that create any difficulties in terms of investigation and prosecution when it's actually the approach has been to define something as not being a crime? Does that, are there associated difficulties for you in, in either as investigators or as prosecutors around that? It's an unusual... Yes, it's an unusual... Um, it's an unusual piece of uh, legislation if it were passed because it defines something which is not a crime, mm. which previously has been a crime. Um, so, uh, but it's all about the specifics of an individual piece of legislation mm. as to whether it causes any difficulty or not. So as a general principle, whilst it's unusual, it's something that we could deal with if, if we had to do it. it uh, it's unusualness doesn't cause any specific mm. issues in itself. It's about knowing what the law is and applying that law. Um, which is important to us as prosecutors. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's sufficient clarity in the bill as it stands to enable you to be able to to apply, you know, to, to know who you shouldn't be prosecuting, if you, if you like? There are there are some specific pieces of the legislation where um, perhaps further clarity may assist us in, in, in our in our job as prosecutors mm -hmm. uh, in relation to um, the bill. I think some of them have been touched upon by the earlier panel and. and most of what I would have to say in relation to them would be fairly similar uh, to what I've, I've heard. And I only caught the second part, I think, of that panel, but they would probably be uh, similar. Uh, what's important for us is to Did know... Just tell us which they are, certainly. without in detail, just to make um, sure we the, know which the, ones the, you... The, the you... specific clauses, I think, um, would be uh, in particular uh, the definitional aspects uh, of the crime uh, and... Uh, the essential safeguards uh, and also the saving clause at the end. Uh, these are uh, the particular passages of the bill which um, uh, perhaps um, in, when we consider a case would, we would have to look at in the same context as we would currently have to look at. Uh, and it would all be about context. It's the definitional aspects which are the bits which perhaps... Uh, so I think it's sections 1, 3, 18 and 24 uh, to be uh, specific about the clauses that, that we'll, we'll be looking at. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, it's, um, whilst the, uh, the decriminalises, if you like, where we, the current situation, it wouldn't obviously preclude someone, uh, you know, a member of the public raising an issue uh, of concern, mm -hmm. which would then you know, more, more than likely necessitate an investigation. But in effect, by engineering out the, a police investigation at the, the forefront, then that clearly would, uh, would be significant to ourselves. And that, you know, there would be no police involvement unless, unless something either from a member of the public or by way of an instruction from the Crown to look at a particular circumstance. So that's clearly very helpful. Mm -hmm. And the Faculty of Advocates suggested there could have been a different type of an approach, um, which is maybe the more common approach, where... You, you would have a definition of so-called criminal activity and certain things are exceptions within the context of that criminal activity. Would that have been an easier approach in terms of your job? In, in, in looking at what is proposed in the bill, I think it would provide more certainty in terms of what we're looking at um, in the bill. And, and so if I perhaps give an example of what I mean in terms of some of the tensions that there are in the Act, uh, as the previous panel mentioned... Um, there is no definition of assisted suicide or, or assisting a suicide. Now, I understand there's an intention that's to give as much flexibility as possible. Uh, but when you look at that, and it's interplay with uh, Clause 18, which talks about nothing authorising anyone to do anything in itself which causes another person's death, uh, that demonstrates to me that everything in this sphere has to be dealt with and looked at in its particular context. So um, there is various parts of various definitional aspects could be brought to that. So what is something that itself causes suicide? I take the intention of that to be uh, the direct 
uh, in causing someone to ingest the medication, perhaps, that they may be using. But it's not entirely clear in terms of the structure of the Act that that is what's intended on the face of the bill as it's drafted at the moment. So that, together with the lack of definition around what it is to assist suicide, still means, uh, from my perspective as a prosecutor, that there are discretionary judgments that should have to be made in relation to this, uh, and perhaps a lack of clarity. The thing to emphasise about the bill, uh, as it's currently drafted, as with the current law, is that the cases would, uh, um, should be very, very fact-sensitive. So mm. the specific facts of any case would be very, very important. Mm. But the way the bill is set up at the moment, it doesn't give that framework of this is what's criminal and this is not. There's still an element of reading that into the particular mm -hmm. uh, clauses of the bill. And, and uh, if that were to remain the case, then the likely consequence would be a police investigation, which by its nature would need to be, you know, intrusive. Um, and you may end up in a situation where you're, you know, the, the, the driver for this is around the dignity um, of the, 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 um, the person's last wishes. And yet the very people that are assisting in this process may find themselves um, being investigated for their actions. And that would happen if a member of the public raised a concern. Even yeah, yeah. I, I'm mm -hmm. sure Stephen would, would mm -hmm. agree with that. Mm -hmm. Now, if that were the case, then you know the, the minutia uh, of the law would probably necessitate that person would be, would be suspected of a, a crime and therefore mm -hmm. would be a suspect. Uh, so mm -hmm. very quickly, it, it, things would develop and you may have an adverse impact on on where we wanted to be in the, the first place. Mm -hmm. And indeed, so in terms of the criminal justice bill could be arrested, in fact, because of the, the new yeah, so terminology. Th there is a need for, mm -hmm. it's been mentioned a number of times, there would be, it would be hugely beneficial for absolute clarity on, on that, those, those points, mm -hmm. so as not to effectively end up in with a, a, a police investigation on behalf of the Crown to safeguard the, you know, the integrity mm -hmm. of the process. Thanks. Um, Margaret, followed by John Finney. Uh, I wonder, Police Scotland in particular, Mr. Um, Mr. Flanagan, yes, Senior Police Scotland, could I ask you about the ensuring the compliance by licensing. Superintendent Very sorry. Get there. He wants to keep it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the role of Police Scotland um, in, with regard to ensuring the compliance by licence facilitators, um, any comments on the provision of the bill? Are you happy with that? Or? I, I, I am. Again, it's, uh, it, would, it would seem that, uh, is that my understanding that, that everything might, in effect, be retrospective, um, as opposed to, um, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure, uh, not entirely clear as to what the, the actual role would be, if I'm being honest. Are you saying that there is a defined role? Um, I think that's um, that one of the points that is there, Should there be uh -huh. a defined role? Uh, no, it's, it's specifically looking um, at the kind of suggested role just now. If you're unclear about it, then it seems to me immediately, you know, the bill is there and we're not quite sure. Um, so th there has been some suggestion that the, the role should be in the legislation um, could be left to guidance issued later by, by ministers, but um, it would be up to Police Scotland to ensure whatever role it was um, was carried out properly and compliance was there. So I think clearly then there's a big question mark on that at present. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's a, if there's a precedent um, in, you know, in our current role where we would take such, a, you know, such involvement in something of this nature. Um, I, it's not something which, um, you know, it's, not, it's something I don't have any, and Police Scotland doesn't have any experience of a role at the moment in such a uh, almost pastoral. Uh, I, I think that what Clause 20 of the bill envisages is that yes. where um, a licensed facilitator um, has assisted a person to end their life, then that person, the licensed facilitator, will have an obligation to advise the police of mm -hmm. that fact. Uh, that clause in itself is, is slightly anomalous uh, with uh, what current practice is in terms of what I would broadly call medical deaths. Now, I know this isn't a medical death, but someone who dies mm -hmm. under medical care uh, and there's a degree of supervision, which is why I'd characterise this in the same way uh, of, of what's going on. 
those deaths are currently matters which would be reported to the Procurator Fiscal, and, and there's a Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit which only deals with that. I, I would suggest that the role there is not for the police, but for the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit, who would be made aware of that. That's typically what would happen in a, a, a sudden death uh, or a death where uh, the person's under medical care and it can't immediately be certified. And I think that would provide the necessary safeguard which the bill is <coughs> attempting to provide. So I, I don't know if that. Uh, yeah, answer or goes to the question uh -huh. that, that it was asked. As though it, it would be more appropriate somewhere else. Yeah, that would simplify, be consistent. That's the, the police. That's the role of the police is to act on behalf of the, you know, the crown in the investigation, the deaths, and take instruction. Mm -hmm. So that would keep that would simplify matters, yeah. and it would, uh, it would certainly be easier uh, for for adoption. Yeah. We've been looking at this in you know a medical context, and almost it will go down a certain. Um, a certain route and, and should be quite easy to, um, well, not really easy, but um, should at least point to certain people dealing with it, Section 20. But where there's a doubt expressed, then the medical contact then moves into perhaps a su suspicious death. And I'm wondering then if you could comment on the savings provision in the bill and also the breaches, potential breaches and penalties issue. The savings provision um, is, is fairly broad as it's currently expressed. And, and again, when you look at that in terms of section uh, or clause one, clause three, and then clause 24, uh, again, I see, I think, what the, the legislative intent is. Mm -hmm. it, it's to make sure that someone isn't penalised for an error in paperwork or, or some such minor error. I think that that's what it's driving at. I'm not sure that that's what it actually says on the face of the bill at the moment. And... Uh, therefore, it, it talks about a person acting in good faith and an intended pursuance of this act. Again, I'm not sure what intended pursuance of this act is. Is it following the steps and in an attempt to follow the statutory scheme? Or is it someone who uh, wants to end their life and knows that there is legislation which allows them to do so and, and perhaps to assist someone to do so? Is that the act in good faith and in pursuance of the act? I think there's still uh, part of that definition that could perhaps be tightened which would um, facilitate the legislative intent, if I understand the legislative intent correctly, but whilst not being quite as wide. Uh, as a prosecutor, it strikes me that any step towards uh, trying to comply with the Act would cause a difficulty then in a prosecution um, if we were to bring a prosecution. Now, it may well be that uh, that's what the Bill in is intended to do so, but the there's a question for Parliament as to whether that's sufficient protection um, in terms of uh, the legislative scheme. It, it does seem to be quite loose, but as I say, I, I, the di there appears to be a slight difference between what the legislative intent, as I understand it is, and the face of the bill. The face of the bill appears to be slightly wider than that. Okay. Yes, I'll move on. I've got John and Sandra, please, followed by Roderick. Thank you, Convener. It's, it's a question for Mr McGowan. And I, I don't know if you were present, Mr McGowan, when, it, when I asked Professor Muller about a comment in the, the Human Rights Commission uh, evidence about the omission doctrine. I don't know if you were. I wasn't. Uh, no. No. Okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll read from their evidence. It says the Commission is also concerned that there's a lack of guidance relating to the admission doctrine, whereby doctors may withdraw life-sustaining treatment and certain knowledge as this will bring about death to the patient. Now, clearly... Um, that's something that's not going to come to the attention of the authorities unless there was any debate about the writing of a death certificate. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, it, it would depend upon the circumstances. As I said earlier, these are very fact-specific uh, cases. There are cases of that nature which I know have been brought to attention and which we have dealt with uh, under the current regime. And, and these are ones you talked about, discretionary judgment. Is that something where you would have envisaged exercising discretionary judgment on? The, the current position is that the law of homicide applies to these cases. And so what we look at when we look at that is the, the case against the law of homicide. So we look at whether a crime has been committed, has that caused the death? And if a crime has been committed, then the crucial thing is the intention. If uh, the intention is to kill then that could be homicide. If that's not the intention, if the intention is to treat and the intention is roundabout palliative care, then it wouldn't be a crime, potentially. But that's a, a, a fine distinction, isn't it? it it's a the, distinction. The, the conscious we, decision not to take an act that would 
sustain a life distinct from um, actually seeking to end a life. Yes, and there, there, there are very few crimes of omission so, uh, in Scots law. Is there anything we can learn from that, was the question I asked Professor Miller, anything we can learn from that in relation to this proposed legislation? It's difficult to say specifically what might be learned. I mean, we're straying into a slightly different topic uh, in relation to that in, in the sense of what treatment's appropriate to those who don't want to take mm -hmm. advantage of the, the proposals that well, were in this Sorry, well. I should have stressed it wasn't in the medical aspect. I was particularly... It, it was about the, the proposal to report to a constable as distinct to... That's something that may be reported directly to you by the medical authorities. No, I, 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 would, ex I, I would expect if there was... Uh, Jubaiti uh, about the cause of death, if it was sudden, if it was under medical care, depends on whether the treatment was a factor in the cause of that death, <coughs> if there were any concerns on the part of the, the family or nearest relatives or anyone else about the cause of death, then that would come to our attention. Any connection with the, the, the situation where a conscious decision is taken not to resuscitate someone, for instance? Then? It would depend upon the circumstances, and, and there are cases of that nature which have been brought to our attention and which we've dealt with over the years. And how have they been dealt with, then, for instance? I, I can't think of an example in which a crime has been committed. Um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Sandra, followed by Roderick, please. Um, thank, thank you very much. And, uh, it's still good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Obviously, the facilitator, and I, I did ask uh, questions previously of the, the, the previous panel, and one of the questions I'd asked, and I think you alluded to it, Mr McGowan, is regarding to any criminal prosecution which could be brought against a facilitator if a member of the public or the family were to basically raise concerns. Now, that, that's one concern, obviously, I think we need to deal with in the legal aspect of it. But also one of the questions I did ask uh, uh, the legal profession was if the the medicine as such was being administrated and it didn't work completely <clears throat> and the person didn't pass away uh, in a certain manner, would that constitute criminal prosecutions against the licensed facilitator as such? Do you see that there's not enough clarification in the bill? In terms of the bill as currently drafted, uh, if uh, the facilitator acted in good faith and intended pursuance of the Act, uh, the conduct by the facilitator would, as I understand the bill, have to be uh, of a quality of reckless uh, mm -hmm. rather than careless. Uh, careless isn't defined in the Act, but taking carelessness as it's known in other criminal contexts, you would have to be reckless mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, facilitate any prosecution, and I don't think that recklessness is protected by the legislation as it's currently drafted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just follow up? To you? Thank you. I noticed that in the submissions from others as well. Another issue I wanted to ask is obviously it involves the police and the legal profession as well. Would it constitute special specialised training perhaps for the police in regard to not just that part of the facilitator's uh, job, as you might say, but also the, the drugs that are available, how they're stored, uh, when they're collected, brought back to the pharmacy, records being kept? Would the police need to have special training on that? From a prosecutor's perspective, oh, sorry, it's, yes. it, it's clear yeah, that any, um, any case of this nature currently, or I imagine uh, if this bill was passed, would be dealt with by uh, people who are specialists. So at the moment, any case of this nature, would there be one of two routes uh, into the Crown Office in relation to that? It would either be through homicide teams or uh, through mm -hmm. the Fatalities Investigation Unit. Both of those uh, groups of prosecutors have got specialist training, but ultimately any decision in relation to this would be made by Crown Council uh, and probably involving law officers. So uh, these are cases where decisions would be taken by a small group of people. If the bill was passed, there may be need for uh, further training and, and, and further uh, internal guidance to make sure that prosecutors are au okay fait with the terms of the specific bill. Uh, and just, and yes, from a police perspective, really, is simply yes. There would be, you know, requirement for awareness raising at all levels. But uh, as Stephen highlights, for the you know for the, the teams that uh, that you know I'm in charge of the major investigation teams. Yes, I would imagine there would be a need for for uh, for more in depth training. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that point, Chief Superintendent, are you content with the <coughs> the evidence of the provision so far about recording processes? It would seem to me if somebody reports to you, 
then if you've got good, uh, uh, you know, robust reporting processes, it makes the police job so much easier. Are you content with what's here just now in terms of recording? I, I think, as Stephen uh, highlights, in terms of recording, yes, I think I am. And Stephen highlights that each case would always be treated on its merits. So it would need that, you know, particular scrutiny to, to see that conditions had been met. Uh, but uh, for, from the information that I've seen, yes, I, I think I, I would be. It didn't seem to be the position about the legal panel. They were not quite so satisfied with recording processes. I wonder where the single repository of, of this documentation is going to be. Yes. Um, in a medical case, um, we know where the medical records will be. We know what format they take. Um, th there's nothing in the bill which specifies where that single record of a person's intention and, and the various steps will be. I, I, again, I think it's perhaps envisaged that the facilitator will, will do that, but it's, it doesn't say that in the bill. So um, there is perhaps a gap. Uh, and if there is a gap, then what that means is potentially a police investigation. And as Gary Flanagan's mentioned, there's a, an element of invasiveness in any police yes. investigation. I'm not sure that's what the framers of the bill had in mind uh, when they drafted it. Yes, answers could be found more quickly, at least in point in the direction. Roderick? Thank you, Convener. Um, if I could just start by just asking one question in terms of the Lord Advocate's submission. Um, it's a paragraph that starts, the account considers there to be sufficient evidence that a person has caused the death of another. It's difficult to conceive a situation where it would not be in the public interest to raise a prosecution, but each case would be considered on its own facts and circumstances. Um, that's fairly black and white. Are, are we really saying that there haven't been any cases, for example, in the last five years where kind of public interest considerations have come to bear? The, the last case of this nature that I recall that we had to take a prosecutorial decision in was uh, a case in 2006. Right. Um, and in that case, it was a man whose brother had, uh, I think it was Huntington's disease. Uh, a prosecution was raised for culpable homicide. Uh, he was convicted and he was admonished by the court. Uh, as, as far as prosecutorial discretion is concerned, the factors that we would take into account in applying that public uh, interest test are set out in detail. I think there are 13 factors which are in the prosecution code. Uh, one of those uh, is about the gravity of the offence and others are about the impact upon uh, the victim. So when you, you speak of uh, the result being a death, then the public interest in prosecution is very high. Uh, so that's uh, what's behind the statement in the, the Lord Advocate's submission. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question is uh, the, the Scottish Human Rights Commission in their submission refer to the decision in the House of Lords in the Purdy case um, and they comment that uh, a, a similar challenge could be made in Scotland and suggest that interim guidelines uh, should be issued by the Lord Advocate. What's your view on that? I, I would say that's not necessary because of the factors which are set out in the prosecution code and, and the Purdy case, which isn't binding in Scotland, I think has to be seen in its context. The, the, the Purdy case uh, came because Mrs Purdy wished to travel abroad to end her life and she wanted her partner to help her in that. Uh, and she wanted to know whether or not he was vulnerable to prosecution in terms of the, the Suicide Act 1961. Uh, her case came shortly after another case of, I think it was Daniel James, who was a 24-year-old rugby player with spinal injuries. And in his case, his family was not prosecuted by the Director of Public Prosecutions, who unusually published his decision as to why he had decided not to take uh, criminal proceedings in that case. And the factors upon which uh, the Director relied not to take proceedings were factors which, for the most part, were actually out with the code uh, for Crown Prosecutors um, that, that was in England and Wales. So when Mrs Purdy said that her Article 8 rights to uh, a family life were being interfered with, uh, the question for the court was whether or not that was in accordance with law. Uh, and because the factors taken into account by the director were factors which were not covered by the Code for Crown Prosecutors, they said that that wasn't in accordance with law. And that's where uh, the director's guidance in England and Wales came. So I think it's very specific to that context in that there was a code which bore to be the factors which were taken into account when a prosecutorial decision was being taken in England and Wales. Uh, and they were not the factors which the director took into account in the James case, which caused Ms Purdy to have that uh, uncertainty 
uh, as to what the law actually was in England and Wales. Okay. D uh, then, just as a kind of side issue, is are either of you aware of uh, um, any kind of statistical information on the number of people who might leave Scotland uh, um, for purposes of ending their life elsewhere? I I'm not, no. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Christian, followed by Patrick. Christian. Thanks very much. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, I can see that uh, there could be some implication regarding life insurance, and I would like to know if you would want more, uh, uh, more clarification in the bill uh, regarding the consequences, and particularly uh, if the life insurance could be the benefit uh, could be the licensed uh, fa fa facilitator, which could happen without. Uh, so licensed facilitator, facilitator knowing about it? I think that's really a matter of Parliament's intention in relation to this. I don't think it's something that I can comment on as a prosecutor uh, as to whether or not uh, someone should still have the benefit of their life insurance and whether there should be any closes. And I, I know that other jurisdictions who um, have legislation to similar effect do have clauses in the legislation which allow someone to have the benefit of uh, the life assurance and it's still to pay out in these circumstances, but I don't think it's something that I can comment upon uh, as a prosecutor. And what about the police? Would it make... I, I mean, I would just simply add that I wouldn't really want to go into the, the, the legislative side, but it, clearly that might be a, a, something which a family member or another family member may raise a suspicion if someone was thought to, to benefit from something of that nature, but other than that, I wouldn't like to comment. Thank you. Patrick. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Can I thank uh, the witnesses for their, their evidence and particularly uh, to emphasise again that where there are areas where evidence suggests a, a, a simple amendment uh, would be beneficial, I'm, I'm certainly very open to discussing that. And For example, the, the argument around reporting to the uh, prosecuting authorities instead of to the police is, is certainly an example where a change would be pretty straightforward to make to the bill. Uh, I suppose the the general question I'd like to put uh, is one that I put in general at the end of the, the previous panel, which is about this question of clarity, um, and particularly to, to Mr McGowan. Um, in terms of the, the prosecution decisions, is it not the case that at present, in the absence of legislation in this area, in the absence of any guidance uh, around how a system of assisted suicide ought to operate, uh, and in the great complexity of people's individual circumstances, uh, of the, uh, the, the actions that have been taken or the questions of inaction, there is a great deal of, uh, a great lack of clarity at the moment uh, for prosecutors in reaching decisions. Uh, I, I can accept that perhaps we'll never have crystal clarity given the inherently complex nature of, uh, of this subject. But is it not uh, a reasonable suggestion that legislation in this area would increase the clarity that both prosecutors have and that individuals would have about what they're allowed to do and what, is, what is, remains a criminal act? I'm not sure that I accept that there's a lack of clarity at the moment. If someone takes steps to assist a suicide, then they may be liable to prosecution in terms of the law of homicide, depending upon what those steps are. Maybe implies a lack of clarity, surely. You, you, can, you can never be, and we can never be entirely certain about anything, mm -hmm. but if you take those steps, you, you may be, and I can't put it any higher than that, you may be uh, liable in terms of the law of homicide, and, and if you were the factors taken into account or in the prosecution code, um, that provides a degree of certainty. Any departure from that is a matter for Parliament, and if, if Parliament legislates for that, then we work in that system, clearly. The bill is presently drafted. There are a number of areas where I'm not certain it gives any more clarity and would suggest that it gives slightly less clarity than the position we're currently in. That's not a comment upon the legislative intent. It, it's simply in terms of the scheme which is set out. I, I think there are one or two areas in which greater clarity uh, and greater definition could perhaps be given. Um, given the, the question which was raised earlier as well about the, um, the, the, the potential for uh, biomedical failure of, uh, of an assisted suicide, yes. uh, uh, is this something that you've looked into in, in preparing your evidence on this? I'm not aware of examples in other countries uh, such as Switzerland which already operate an assisted suicide 
uh, system where where that has been a problem. And I'm a little bit concerned that we uh, kind of build up I, the potential for a problem I like think that. that's a question which uh, is perhaps better directed at those with the medical or pharmacological, ph pharmacological uh, experience to know um, how the mechanics of this would work and how various uh, medication and drugs work. Um, uh, you know, my comments are simply in relation to if that happened, this would be my assessment of, of what the response would be from a prosecutor's point of view. I'm not aware of any uh, facts or circumstances or specific statistics in relation to that, no. But I, I don't think it, it's, it's really my area. Okay, thank you. Could I just yep. offer an observation, Mr Harvey, to your point? I think it's the, the point you made about the decisions to prosecute are, are valid. I think it's worthwhile pointing out that there's a great likelihood that the people would be subject to an investigation, and that in itself would be, you know, in the circumstances, maybe very, very traumatic and is likely to, you know, introduce all sorts of, you know, difficulties and anxieties. So it's worth saying that, that it's not necessarily just about the impact of a decision to prosecute or, or, or otherwise. There would be the associated investigation, which would be fairly significant to the individuals involved as well. I, I appreciate that, and, and I appreciate the, the, the context in which you've raised that, that concern, and I think all of us would be concerned to minimise any risk of unnecessary uh, stress or anxiety for, for people in that situation. But I, w I would again suggest that in the absence of any legislation, in the absence of a well-regulated system, uh, is it not already the case that uh, a small number of people uh, who feel the need to... Uh, give assisted suicide without a legal basis for that uh, and who's subject to prosecution or, or subject to the pros prospect or the possibility of prosecution very often would anticipate uh, that making a decision like this uh, in very, very difficult circumstances at the end of a, a loved one's life, uh, that's, that's a, a, a situation they face at present. Uh, in the absence of legislation, uh, people in that circumstance are not protected from the possibi possibility of investigation or prosecution, far from it. Yes, I, I agree with that, yes. Thank you. So, sorry, are you saying that... Well, yes, I, I, I take, I take are that. Are you agreeing that... that, uh, that I'm not prejudging uh, the, the, an individual circumstance uh, and uh, the point made about just now, yes, people would possibly anticipate an investigation. I'm saying that in the spirit of the legislation that's been uh, progressed, that it would be... An, it would be advantageous to uh, recognise and to avoid uh, any unnecessary investigation. I and thought in Patrick that, was asking um, that this, the position just now, as we appreciate, is sensitive and delicate and usually handled in that way by the prosecution services, mm -hmm. but that having something in legislation which requires processes to be gone through and recorded should surely um, assist uh, police and the Crown Office from deciding whether or not they need to go beyond a paper investigation rather than, you know, have to, in these situations, actually meet people face to face. I think that's the point Patrick was trying to make in, in squeezing it down to processes and recording. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, agree with, I agree with that, that uh, the intention's there and that that would be, that would be agreeable. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm not sure that it does simply on the basis of the current drafting. I think, as I've said before, there's a, some of the definitional elements, I think, yeah, it would have to be tightened up. So what, in effect, the bill would do was introduce a regime uh, of assisted suicide in Scotland. And that might mean, because of some of the definitional aspects of the bill, an increase in the number of those investigations, as I see it. But... But it, it, Forgive it, me it, for it, saying it's raw, but you know it's it, it, a indeed way it's, to go. It, it, it's subject to amendment and uh, further consideration uh, by the Parliament. Do you want to say any more? No. I, I suppose simply to, to observe that um, for someone who'd been caring for a loved one uh, through difficult circumstances, through a, a life-shortening or terminal illness, uh, who'd been supporting them through making this decision, uh, the prospect of having to have a conversation uh, with uh, an investigating officer after they had confidence that they'd taken these steps properly in compliance with the law, that, frankly, might be the, the last of their worries. Might, might be a, a fairly minor thing for them to contemplate uh, if, if they feel that they've given their loved one 
uh, the, the freedom to make a decision on their own terms and that that's been a, a profoundly important thing to them. Rather than a question, but it doesn't matter. Can I, can I say that's the end of this session? I thank you very much for your evidence. I'll suspend for just a couple of minutes, but we stay put because we'll move on to the next uh, panel. very much. Uh, next, next item is an evidence session on the reduction in the drink driving limit proposed in the Draft Road Traffic Act 1988 Prescribed Limit Scotland Regulations 2014. This session is a draft. This session will inform next week's evidence session on the instrument with the Cabinet Secretary of Justice. Now, welcome to the meeting our panel of witnesses, Chief Superintendent Ian Murray, Police Scotland, Dr Peter Rice, Chair of the Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Problems, and Margaret Decker, We've had you here before, Mr. Secker. I remember your campaigns. Um, uh, Research Secretary of Scotland's campaign against irresponsible drivers. Uh, we have submissions on the proposed limit to the original Scottish Government consultation, so I'll go straight to questions. Uh, take, take you first this time, uh, 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 Christian. Not had you before, Elaine. Thank and then Sandra. Thank Christian. you very much, Governor. Uh, good morning, it is the morning. Uh, we heard a lot on the, on the media. Uh, the reaction of uh, people when we heard about the, the change in the limit. And I have to say, I, I do agree with some of the comments that we made regarding uh, the areas of uh, the penalties for, for the offence. It, it looks like that uh, a lot of people out there think that it might be very unfair uh, that uh, uh, people who are caught on the lower side of the offence will get uh, the same uh, penalties than somebody who will be on the higher side. So is there, uh, and particularly, I, I'm, I'm uh, somewhere worried that maybe the hard luck stories may over time reduce the level of public support. And that does concern me. Do you think it is, it is, it is a concern? Excuse me, a wee bit lost there. I, um, you're not, are you suggesting a variation in the penalties? We haven't got power to do that. Yeah, it's, but it is, is the reason I'm, I'm asking, do you think it's... Uh, we know, I know we haven't got the power I to do I beg your pardon. I do know the law. I took terrible of me. Yes. But, but we maybe ended up having it... OK. Uh, by, by, I appreciate by, by, that. By, by another way. But do you think it's, 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 it's an important part of, of the legislation? If we had the power to do that, is it something you, 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 you will want to do? Well, if you'd like me to answer first, I, I must be honest, I, I don't, wouldn't support any variation within the penalties. I think when you look at uh, the research, which suggests that uh, even at the new lower limit that's being proposed, you know, individuals are three times more likely to die in a crash than if they hadn't taken alcohol before they drove. 
and there's obviously sufficient evidence out there that suggests that any alcohol, you know, does have that impairing, you know, effect on your ability to drive and your ability to concentrate and reaction times, etc. So, um, I must be honest. I think that, that to suggest that between, you know, if we're already looking at that statistic, then to go higher with the, the existing limit, you're looking at six times more likely to die in a crash. So I must be honest, I'm, I'm not in a, a, a place in my own head where I think it, you want to vary between whether you're three times more likely to kill yourself or somebody else, or six times, and whether the penalty should vary depending on, on how that works. My view is that as you're putting somebody at risk and putting yourself at risk, that therefore the penalty needs to be such that it's a deterrent effect. And I think, again, the studies that have happened across the countries which already have the limit that's now being proposed have shown that all blood alcohol level uh, counts tend to drop, that it has that deterrent effect, and the whole... Um, overarching picture of drink driving changes. So I think that deterrent effect is what's being looked at and, and therefore uh, I think to lessen the impact now of the, the, the purpose of this, which is to improve safety, to lessen the impact by suggesting that we would lo lower the, the penalty at the same time means that we're not taking it, to me it suggests we wouldn't be taking it seriously. Mrs Decker, do you want to say the court already has you know, powers to... Um you know, to um, to sentence. You know, and you know, we keep getting told. You know, sheriffs, it's up to them to decide what the penalties are. So, um, I think it would be a matter for out with uh, our, our remit really to comment on that now. I think it's mandatory that you lose your license, don't you, for 12 months? Yes. I'm about to be corrected by a resident advocate. The exceptional circumstances. Yes. Yeah. Exceptional circumstances. But yeah. the basic rule is you lose your license. Does anybody else wish to comment on varying the penalties um, somewhere else in Europe? Dr. Yes, there's, there's, I think your question also touched on the level of public support for, for, for the measure. And um, there are high levels of public support for drink driving action. There's also levels, majority levels of public support for actually a whole range of alcohol, other alcohol measures, but uh, which sometimes surprises people. But um, for drink driving, the level of public support is, is, is high. Um, and... I don't think there's a substantial risk that, that lowering the, 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 the level is going to lead to... You know, in some other countries, drink driving is looked at a little bit more like a kind of parking ticket. And, and it's one of the, I think, distinctive things in the United Kingdom that's regarded as a, as a serious offence by the general public. Uh, I don't see a substantial risk that, that lowering the limits going to lead to kind of diminution in the seriousness of this in the in the public eye. I absolutely agree with... with um, my, my colleagues from, from Police Scotland, that uh, the, the, the impairment at, at 50 remains significant and substantial, and uh, I think the public realise that. And I, I don't think there's a risk that this will diminish the importance of drink driving in the, in the eyes of the public. Can I, can I just add one comment to that? Again, the most recent road safety information tracking study survey that's been carried out on behalf of Road Safety Scotland, in those figures, 95% of those people um, who were surveyed believe that drinking and driving with a limit is a very serious offence, and the, the, and the further 4% believe it to be serious. So you're looking at 99% of, of people surveyed believing that drinking over the, over the legal limit is either very, or very serious or serious. So I think the public support and the perception is there, certainly, at the moment. Yes. Maybe I, I can add to that. Uh, it's ex exceptional uh, circumstances uh, could be maybe extended to other cases, but we have already in, in law. I think, I think I'm with Margaret insofar as the, the courts already have that power to take on board the, the circumstances and to, and to make a, a determination. And, and I think um, that's where we would give our evidence and, and that's where that would be taken. So um, I must be honest, I believe there's sufficient scope within the system as it is just now. Thank you. I don't think it's used very often. To the, uh, maybe the exceptional circumstances, I think, if I ask Mr Campbell, it's not successful so very often it's quite often pledged but I don't think it's very successful very often um, I now take Margaret then Elaine um, all right I think I'm this next excellent could I ask the resource bar burden on Police Scotland in terms of um, the anticipated increase in convictions at the moment we're, we're still obviously looking and we'll, we'll do some survey work uh, over the next few weeks, because um, you know some of the, the data is, is slightly hard to come by just now. Um, I think it's the, the estimation just now we have is that we are likely to catch maybe a third more drink drivers than we're doing at the moment in the initial phase of this. Although the research does show, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that um, drink driving and blood alcohol counts across the board tend to drop. So certainly my uh, ex expectation and my hope would be that uh, the public will learn. There's quite a significant campaign, you know, going to be ratcheted up through November into December, 
uh, in terms of making people aware of the implications. And again, we've already been doing that through the drink drive uh, initiatives of last winter and also in the summertime. Um, and we'll also be speaking to drivers from this point on to make them aware as we do breathalyse people and we're getting values that are over the new limit but, st but below the existing limit. So as that message starts to permeate, my hope is that the worst case scenario could be as many as a third more, but I would like to think that will be less. Um, is there not a, a significant chance that there would be more convictions for people under, um, in terms of the morning after? And, you know, maybe I can ask, if, if, once you answer that, um, Chief Constable, you, I could ask the rest of the, the panel if they can offer any advice to people how they would be able to, to be sure that they wouldn't be um, over the limit the morning after. Before you're promoted to Chief Constable, Chief Superintendent. <laughs> I, was quite, I was quite grateful for that. I <laughs> that a field do. promotion was good, thank you. <laughs> um, certainly in terms of what we found during the last winter was 10% was of those convicted, of those uh, detected. We had 434 detections during the, the, the four weeks of last winter's drink drive campaign. 10% of those were found uh, after 6 o'clock in the morning. So there is that risk, if you like, that there would be, a, again, a small increase within that. Um, before my colleagues have answered on this, I mean, my view would just be the simple message is don't. You know, I think that's the only way, you know, don't, that is the message. If you're going to be driving in the morning, then don't drink the night before. Mm. Uh, but how do you know? Mm. Yeah, this is, I think, for, for the public. Mm. How do they know if they're out for an evening meal? Because we know it's different for different people and what they eat and the size and the metabolism. But how do they know, um, uh, you know, if they get into the car the next morning, whatever time, that they've, they've waited long enough or not? You know, it's. It, it, I'm not trying to make excuses. I think it's a genuine problem for the public. Mm -hmm. Certainly if you're sitting in the pub and you're drinking, you come out and drink, yeah, easy peasy. But if you've had a meal the night before or shared a bottle of wine with a pal or somebody, how do you know that you're not going to be over the limit the next morning? I think it just is a, a planning ahead to make yourself aware of the fact that you can't take the chance. But how do you know? This is my point. You, you. I mean, you say nobody should have anything in the evening, before the evening. You know, that's. I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just no, trying no, to. I know. I understand the point. You know but I, th I think it's that notion. People of who you've got to prioritise. Innocently, as it were. Yeah, I think it's just a case of prioritising the aspects of your life in terms of you know when do you drink and when do you not drink and when is it when do you need to drink or when is the importance of that within your life that you decide what you're doing and, and when are you doing it. Um, I'm sure Peter can throw, throw more light on that, but I think, yes. you know, for me, that the message, you know, the simple message we've always been saying is don't risk it. You know, the fact is we're, we're not talking about a legal limit as well. We're also talking about the concept of there's an impairment. So it's not just about a legal limit. The fact is your, your ability to drive is impaired potentially. So therefore, you know, you have to be aware of that yourself. Although you may be feeling fine, the fact it's is you may still be... It's not the point. Impaired. It's not the point. Yes, we admit there'll be an impairment and, and so on. I think we'd admit all that, but it's how do you know you are over that limit, even now, let alone a lower limit. Dr Peter Rice, perhaps you can assist with some guidance for the public. Um, I, I, I will, because it's an important question. And while I, I think you always couch it in, in caveats of individual variability and so on, pe people do need some, some, I think, some, some, some relatively firm guidelines. And you, you, you gave us a scenario, you know, sharing a, having a half bottle of wine with, with a meal. And if you started drinking that half bottle of wine at 8 p.m., with your meal, your blood alcohol would be getting to zero about 2 a.m. You know, the, 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 the following day. So that's, you know, about the, that, so that's an indication. If you drink more heavily than that, and I think this is an important point, your, yes. your, your metabolism of alcohol doesn't speed up if you drink more heavily. So it's like your alcohol metabolism system is like a, is like a, a shop with one checkout. You know, it can only go at one speed if you drink more heavily, there are no additional... I'm just trying to think that through, but I'll... Right, OK, well, if you think it takes you... If it takes you two... If it takes a shop two minutes to put pe pe people through a checkout and somebody's coming in every minute, you're right. going to end up the big, long queue. Okay. Um, some shops will be able to call people through from the back to open out another checkout. Your liver is not like that, OK? Your liver does not <laughs> speed up. Uh, so it chugs away at, at, at about 10 mLs, the, 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 the standard unit uh, an hour and nothing speeds that up coffee sleep shower exercise eating 
thing. Full Scottish breakfast, none of that makes any, any difference. Um, <laughs> what so, happened to Iron Brew and a Bacon Roll? <laughs> well, I, I know they, they may have good marketers, but uh, again, <laughs> that uh, whatever magical properties people in Dowden, uh, Iron Brew and Bacon Rolls or Square Sausages, um, that, that, they're no more than that. So yes. basically it's time yeah. uh, is, is the only thing that clears alcohol from your system. And I say to use your scenario, um, the... the uh, that individual drinking a half bottle of wine starting at 8pm would, would be getting to zero blood alcohol in the in the early morning. They might, in fact, wake up because they're <laughs> pretty much that time because that's what's happening to them. Um, I, I think, uh, again, f f fully agree with Ch Chief Superintendent that, that the morning after thing is not an unintended consequence. People are significantly impaired if their blood alcohols are at those, those levels, so it's an intended consequence because it's a risky thing to be doing. Um, and but I, I, I would say that people are going to be needing to be drinking fairly heavily or having very short sleeps to really be running into that problem. But people do need to be aware of, the, you know, their, you know, you know, the rate of metabolism and, and, and calculate a bit accordingly. So, in these circumstances, then, if. Um, if that's the case, should there be a very extensive programme of education so people know exactly? Because there's lots of law abiding. I mean, I don't think the intended consequence that no one in Scotland who's a driver should ever drink just in case the morning after they're going to be over. So that's the other extreme of, um, of, of what we would take as a logical conclusion. Clearly, yeah. that isn't the purpose of it because so many people are absolutely law-abiding and, you know, would be appalled at the idea of drinking when still yeah. um, feeling the effects of drink, whereas others have no regard whatsoever and will be many times over and mm. get into their car. Mm. So I think if we're looking at this, we want to ensure that we are targeting these people who really go out there and pose a real danger, as well as educating the public and making sure that people don't, by default... Uh, fall into that category. Yes. Can, can I just say that road casualties cost not only in emotional and fa financial um, terms to families, but also the rippling effect to the NHS, emergency services, insurance companies and the like. Um, to hold a driving licence is a privilege. Um, I think lots of people forget it as a privilege and they feel it's a right. You know, and <laughs> to protect that licence, you have to abide by the laws. Um, and we welcome the fact that the drink drive limit has been reduced to in line with other European countries. My point, Mrs Decker, is that how do you advise the public? I don't think uh, you're suggesting if you're a driver you never ever drink. No, I'm not suggesting so that. So it's how people can be absolutely sure yeah. if they've um, been at a, a wedding or something the, the day before when they get into the car next day, they are not going to unintentionally be over the limit. Well, I mean, I think I'd go along with the BMA. You know, you don't overindulge. I mean, everything in moderation. Um, I don't think being a wedding allows you the fact to um, ignore the law and, you know, drink to your tipsy. It could be at the time um, you, you drive next day. Uh, it could be your metabolism. It could be all these things. You know, I, I'm pausing this. If we're going mm -hmm. to do it, let's make sure um, that the, we're doing it for all the right reasons and it is going to have the the um, intention that um, we want, which is to cut down on road traffic. Um, we're not putting valuable resources somewhere uh, where they might be better deployed to have the same. For example, just if, you, if I may, um, convener, we don't know that the penalties, if it's uh, a loss of licence, for example, for, for someone being over the, the 50 um, milligram limit, if that leads to job um, loss, if so on and so forth. And there are other consequences there that um, should be looked at and weighed up? Well, as I say, a driving licence is a privilege. And, you know, to protect that licence, you have to abide by the law. Um, I mean, it's good we're only too aware of the devastating consequences of loss of life and the financial impact in these families mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. You know, there's a balance to be struck here. Mm -hmm. And I think lowering the drink li drive limit to 30... Um, 50. 50 megs per 100 ml of blood alcohol is not unreasonable. It's already been proven in other European countries that it brings down the road casualties for drink driving. I think it's, really to it's my just mind, clarity. It's only a start, it's only a start this to, to eradicate the scourge 
of drink driving in Scotland. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're disputing Nobody the level. Is. I oh, think it's oh. the, and, and uh, certainly I can say from my experience of being in court, that to say you're going to lose your job takes you nowhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the court hears that I, just I about every time. But I think the issue families. about, we're still getting back this issue of the knowledge of the person, obviously. Uh, if it's the, the biggest issue is the day before. Uh, mm -hmm. the day before or the evening before. And I, I think, Dr Rice, your information was very helpful. Perhaps you should be producing a wee booklet to let us uh, have an idea. <laughs> I know there's differences and you can't rely on it, but it gives, the, I think, public do need guidance uh, about, so when they should say to themselves, oh, wait a wee minute here, I'll, you know, I'll err on the side of caution tonight. And at this time, I'll not, no thank you, you know, two glasses is sufficient, even though it's night time, that's fine. You know, that kind of thing is helpful to people who I think would be not knowing whether or not they were uh, liable to be breaking the law and certainly wouldn't want to be breaking the law, Mrs Decker. You know, that's the issue, I think, that we're trying to get at. Um, I'm going to take... I think most of the questions will be on this issue. <coughs> Am I correct? Yes. yes All right, so I'll take... Uh, 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 who's next on my list? Elaine. <coughs> and then I'll take John. It was really the same issue. I mean, I think <coughs> most of us can... Excuse me. <coughs> water, water. Just water, yeah, yeah. water, yes, just no, water. unfortunately, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I think most, most of us can see the, the case for, for the re reduction. It brings us in, into line with the, the rest of the Europe, and I think, in fact, the UK stands out as being exceptionally high. But I think for, for a lot of it, I think we don't know what it means for somebody who's been responsible the night before, you know, at what stage should they start to drink? You say somebody's gone out for a works night out on the Friday. At what stage on the next day can they go and do their Christmas shopping, for example? Uh, is there a case that people should be able to breathalyse themselves, actually just to make sure before they get in the car that they're not over the limit? They're on the market. Mm, mm. Are they? They're on the market. We better yeah, not advertise. Yeah. I'm not yeah. it to people to Google it. Yeah. Yes. Because, I mean, one of the things that ACPOS said was that it should be a significant media campaign prior to any reduction coming into effect. Now, this is due to come into effect on the 5th of December. Is there really enough time to make sure that the public are fully aware uh, of the consequences, not just in the don't, go out, don't drink if you're, going out, if you're driving your car, which I think most of us understand, but the consequences for the following day, even if they have been responsible the day before? Can I just say, it's all about taking responsibility. Um, I mean, if there's any doubt, you can get the bus or a taxi or something. You know, there's other modes of transport besides cars to get, you know, to get you to where you're going. Not in some parts of the world, no. no. Speaking of <laughs> a rural person, what about a bike then? <laughs> she, she has to ride a bike. Horse. Have you got no, a horse? Really. She doesn't have a horse anymore. No, 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 I, th I, yeah. I think it's just that, that you know, which, yeah, I mean, the uh, Chief Superintendent rightly says it's about impairment. Now, if you have a heavy cold, you're impaired. You shouldn't be driving. But, uh, I mean, I believe that a heavy cold can have the same effect on your ability to react as being over the limit, the current limit. So, but, you know, nobody thinks, oh, I better not drive because I've got a cold. And in fact, if you were, you, you, the whips here would take a dim view of us not coming to work because we've got a heavy cold, you know. So, you know, there are other, other issues about impairment that, that you know, that yeah, I think possibly people should be aware of and aren't. Yeah, I mean, there's a point in this insofar as um, mm. the, the point you've yeah, made about you targeting and, and just the point you've made there about impairment. I mean, bear in mind that the vast majority of vehicles we stop, we're stopping for a reason and it's because something to do with an offence that's been committed or risk-taking behaviour or something about the manner of driving that's drawing attention to themselves. So, you know, th this idea of, of stopping people in the morning after, the likelihood is they will brought themselves to our attention. We're not, sort of, you know, we're not uh, setting up road checks in the outskirts of, of housing estates at six in the morning to see who's going to the work. Um, you know, so within that, we are finding people who are already putting themselves in a position where they are maybe speeding or something else they're doing wrong or the way they've, you know, overtake it's anything that's drawing attention. So right away, there's an element about risk, there's an element of behaviour, and that's where we then start to pick up element of impairment as well through the, through the drink element. So those who are, you know, behaving responsibly, who are being considered the night before, who are taking a consideration in the morning as to when they drive and then drive according to law anyway, will not have to worry about coming to the police attention. You know, so there is that element of, you know, it's, it is, as Margaret says, about taking responsibility. It's being aware of what you're doing, how you're doing it. Um, and uh, doing that so over the limit, mightn't they? So, I mean, actually, that's not the point. The point is whether or not you're impaired. But and if you're point, impaired above 50... But the point for me it, still comes back to the point of you're still putting yourself and others at risk because there is yes. an impairment. If you're sitting yes. over the new proposed limit at that time in the morning, there is a degree of impairment whether mm. you feel it or not. I think, I think what my, my point is, is that... The, in terms of the education of, of people being aware when they're impaired, not necessarily yeah. that the police have noticed that they're impaired and they're driving, but being aware that certain things, like having a bit of alcohol in your blood, like 
having a, as I say, having a heavy cold or something like that actually probably means you shouldn't be driving and you have to be aware of the education to, to, on people to know that they are impaired yeah. under those circumstances. But let's keep to the draft, yes, yes. which isn't about having a heavy cold. No, but I, I, it's, it's not the analogy. heavy cold it's an draft. I know, I know what an analogy is, yes. Mm. I mean, certainly, mm. certainly there's a marketing mm. campaign about to kick into place. I think mm. that the mm. understanding obviously mm. has to be to the point where, you know, to tell the public when it's going to happen. So I think I think this mm. is why, obviously, th this is, is so vital in terms of going through the process so that can kick in. There's television advertising, there's all sorts of marketing being done, there's all sorts of media stuff waiting to kick in as soon as it's a, a green light, really. So um, that will be there. And I said, we're doing it live time now anyway when we're stopping motorists and making them aware. So it, it, it will be there. And I suppose it's just that perception of, of the question of do you think that's long enough or not? That, that'll be for yourself. But th there is a significant amount of money being spent through Safer Scotland and Road Safety Scotland to make this happen. Mm. I was teasing Elaine a bit about heavy colds, but if you've taken medication mm. with alcohol in it, which you've mm -hmm. said it would be that some of them have, especially for heavy yeah. colds and so on, and you also have taken some alcohol, but only with the addition, if one has a test, with the alcohol in the, med in, in, in the medicine, have you gone over the limit? Would that be any kind of defence if you could prove it? And would it be able to be distinguished from by an examination of the blood of a sample of someone? The, um, uh, yeah. the, the levels of alcohol in mouthwashes cold remedies, these, these kind of things, is, 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 is not substantial. Um, it's certainly compared to, you know, the alcohol that people would co you know, be consciously drinking for, for, for uh, you know, for, for the, the effects of alcohol. So um, I, I think it's um, the level of... Uh, so if, if you're saying, might somebody be over the limit because they were a bit over enthusiastic with with the night nurse i think yes. that's <laughs> um i think they'll have been over enthusiastic with something else would be my i think but I'd if it added to if yeah. i did no you're, I, they're like, yeah. you're teasing me a bit you know if you okay. if you would without the night nurse yes okay you wouldn't have been over the limit yes. would that be a defense if it you would could not. prove it I, I, my, my no. understanding is, is it would not no, no. right okay no. that's that could, this can is I just in make, this make, booklet you're going to produce obviously don't rely well, on I night can, nurse i can <laughs> the um, I, th I think I'd, I'd like to turn to a point I think I did make, make earlier that the, that the following day issue is is only going to crop up if people have drunk pretty substantially the okay. night before. Now I know and I've, my professional life has spent a lot of time speaking to people who drink very substantially, but really we're talking about consumption. If we're talking about an eight hour sleep, we're talking about consumption levels of an excess of a bottle of wine, half bottle of spirits six pints of average strength beer these are you know, all together or separately uh, the, 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 uh, these are <laughs> optional I can't uh, be lost. these are or not not and <laughs> but um <laughs> and i think the point I, I want to make is is that if, if people are drinking at those levels there are, there are of course other risks that are running aside from driving we have very considerable amounts right. of deaths and injuries from intoxicated pedestrians in, in this country, uh, injured by sober drivers, and some estimates, in fact, the numbers of those exceed the number of people who are killed or, or, or seriously injured by drink drivers. Right. So, the you know there are, there are all sorts of risks that come with intoxication. If you turn up at your local A and E department with a with an injury or trauma because you're intoxicated, they don't say, "Oh well, fine, at least you're, you weren't driving." You know, it's it's a, it's a significant injury, yes. and they, they need to deal with it. So. I think that would be. Um, I think I just point that I would want to, to 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 make that that any risk of morning after is is also going to be in someone who's taking considerable non-driving risks because of the amount of drinking that they, they've done the night before. Mm. Many people do that, and many of them get away with it, but many people don't, and you, you know that it needs to be seen in that context. Yeah. Thank you, John, and then Sandra, then Roderick, then Alison. Uh, uh, thank you, Kavina. It was to pick up on a point my colleague uh, Margaret Mitchell made earlier on to yourself, Chief Superintendent, there, where she used the term burden. Now, uh, I would disagree with the, the convener. Dr Rice gave a, a number of eloquent explanations of um, uh, limits, but I think the public probably would more readily understand yours, don't do it the night before. Um, I wonder, do you get frustrated at all these various what-if, if I mix up type of... Um, questions that are put to police officers i think being honest i think i think i'm i'm with margaret very much it's about personal responsibility i mean we still are looking you know somebody dies in the roads of scotland every two days i mean this is an unacceptable state so and there's all these risk-taking behaviors that people engage in 
you know, drink and drug driving is one of those. And there's, so that whole element of it's an accident and this is this concept of I didn't mean it. You know, th th this is something we put ourselves at risk voluntarily by getting behind the wheel or by using the road in some way. And therefore, our duty to each other and to ourselves is, is paramount for me. So therefore, I must be honest, I have little sympathy with the argument that says, but I didn't know. Because you have to know and you have to take that responsibility. Um, and, you know, therefore, I, in my view around it, the whole drink limit is I, th I think if, if we are at a stage where you, you can't not drink tonight, then that's a really sad indictment of, of our society that says, I, you know, I've got to drive in the morning or no, I can't have a drink. Well, I think to me that's something you make that decision. You decide who drives, who doesn't drive, and you balance your life accordingly. So, so that, but that's a personal view. That's, but I do think that, you know, we, we find that ourselves in these circumstances that road safety and casualty reduction is such a huge responsibility for us all. And we need to put it into that round of it's all about risk taking and how we how we interact with each other, and therefore we have a duty to ourselves and to others in how we approach all aspects of use of the road. And, and clearly, as, as the other witnesses have alluded to, it's not simply a matter for the police; other agencies that involve the health service, but more importantly, society. Can you um, tell me what uh, one of the suggestions is that uh, this change could result in up up to 17 lives being saved? What is the burden for Police Scotland of 17 fatal collisions involving drunk drivers? I mean, it's huge. I mean, I mean, Margaret's already alluded to the cost of, you know, sort of 1.9 million per fatal collision to, to society, you know, but, the, the, you know, the time that takes in terms of operational time, you'll be looking at a minimum team of four officers for a minimum period of five days working solidly on uh, on that fatality itself. Um, so by the time you add that, you know, serious collisions will, will be slightly less, but it's a significant amount of time. So you are looking at work, you're losing a working month, if you like, for each fatality. Um, within. So that obviously adds up across the, across the year, and that's just those who are di directly involved in the investigation of the, of the incident. There'll be, th there'll be others associated around it, and obviously the impact thereafter in Crown Office and the courts and whatever. So it does roll on and on, and as Margaret said, the health service and all these people who've been involved, you know, from the ambulance teams who are attending in the first place to, you know, to the, the hospitals, wherever, particularly if the person doesn't die at the scene, where you've then obviously got a protracted period of care that may go on. So it is a significant burden in terms of how we respond to that, and that obviously then impacts on our ability to target other areas of risk taking on the roads and, and whatever else if I've got teams of officers dealing with fatalities. Trauma for the individuals involved in dealing from all Hugely, these Hugely, yes. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, and this is a cumulative trauma, if you like. I mean, I mean you know, traffic officers go out there daily and deal with horrendous scenes, you know, and there is a, a you know, we have a, an issue and a duty of care around how we deal with our officers as well. So um, when you're looking at an average of 200 deaths a year over the last sort of 68 years, and that's, that's a lot of death and a lot of destruction, 1,900 serious collisions a year, you know, that's a lot of people um, injured and, and hurt unnecessarily on our roads. Just finally to confirm, you, Police Scotland is more than up for this change. We are. We'll be ready. We, are, we support it fully and we'll be ready to implement it on the date proposed. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I don't think it's an issue of whether we're up for it. I think it's the difficulties for the public we're really looking at. I don't dissent from what John has asked and what you've said. And obviously, um, you know, people affected is appalling. But I think we're just testing how the public, you, take, you must take them with you uh, in, in enforcement. Um, I have Sandra followed by Roderick, please. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Convener. Um, yeah. no, it's just past 12, so good, af good afternoon. We know that one in nine deaths in the roads, you know, basically are caused by drivers uh, over the limit and many, many more injuries and, and collisions also. But if I could just perhaps put a wee bit of perspective into what some people have been saying. I remember, recollect many, many years ago when there wasn't, what you might say, a limit and it was carnage, basically, with people drink driving. So I think they have got to take responsibility. I agree with what Margaret said about the education, and obviously you're looking towards uh, putting that forward, educating drivers. Uh, I always think that uh, a car in the hands of uh, uh, someone who's had a drink, uh, to me, is a lethal weapon, and perhaps that people should learn their responsibilities in that respect. But one of the questions I wanted to ask, and it's leading on to the education, and obviously I'm assuming it's going to be running the TV, et cetera, et cetera. When this um, legislation comes into force, we will have a different drink driving limit from the have in the rest of the UK. Mm -hmm. How are we you know, going to look at that? Is there going to be advertising uh, down south or does it come over the border or whatever it may be? The campaign is, is there's national elements to this in terms of media and also broadcast media as well to make sure it's there. 
it is being looked at just now um, in terms of whether that has to extend into other modes of transport. You know, whether if you're using a train, you know, so do you have a drink on the train? If you're flying, do you have a drink in the airport? Whichever way you're going, would obviously could have a different impact. So that's being considered as well as to how we engage with the, you know, the operating companies and those who are providing those services. So that you, and again, whether you're motorway services, you know, so whether there's, there's posters and whatever else, you know, whether they're strategically placed so that drivers will see them, so they're aware as they're heading either north or south where the change will happen. Um, so that's all being considered as part of the campaign. There's there's a, a number of agencies, because also a heavy reliance on social media as well to make sure that the messaging is out there. Um, so all the traditional media that I'm more acquainted with and also moving into the newfangled stuff to make sure we, we catch as many people as possible. But there's a significant investment and it's a, it's a very extensive campaign that's planned. If, if I could just say, it's, it's not an unusual situation in other parts of Europe. No. That people are driving across borders with different mm -hmm. limits and... Uh, 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 so I, I think there are systems that have that have developed, and there might be some merit for, from international learning. But it's um, it, it's it's not a great problem that you 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 hear about from my colleagues in other countries. So it's it's you know there are examples where this has worked without any, any great difficulty. It would it would seem. I can just say um, you know Scotland has led the way in lowering the drink drive limit, and it's only a matter of time before the rest of the UK fall into line. Um, and I have to say, in Westminster, they've already de developed a handheld saliva device for drugs, which I think, you know, is is equally important as drink driving. You know, at present, the f field impairment test is pretty basic, uh, and you know, it has been argued that there's more drug drivers on the road than drink drivers. So, you know, I would hope that the Parliament would see the next step in implementing, you know, a, a, a roadside drug testing kit. Um, to enable the police, you know, to tackle um, the casualties in the road. Just, just one final thought. Uh, thank you, Convener. <clears throat> yeah, I, I do agree with everything that you've said, in particular uh, yourself, sir, in regards to the differences in the European legislation in different countries. And that was a point I was trying to make. They have moved on from there. It's time we moved on as well, and we can learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Roderick, please. Then Alison. Panel. I just wondered if uh, anyone on the panel thought that we were missing the trick by not going for restrictions on younger drivers and random breath tests. It's a, I mean, it's a consideration. I mean, there's certainly, um, I think the, the perception before is that maybe it was a step too far from that element of, of public support. Um, you know, in terms of also perhaps mixed messaging, um, there, there's certainly the, you know evidence to suggest that younger drivers, again, in terms of uh, capacity, in terms of tolerance, in terms of maturity, in terms of you know never mind driving skill, that there is a, a greater risk, and therefore some countries have looked at uh, lower limits or whatever. Um, but there does then come a point, I think, that I suppose again speaking personally, I have a difficulty with where it comes to the point of well done, you've held your license for two years, you can drink more. Um, so there is a degree for me that you know there's the, the, the argument I think and maybe I think Margaret was, was hinting at it, the idea that you know you, you would continue to drive the limit down you know full time if you look at the Scandinavian countries you know the, the, you know they're shocked that we're only just coming down to, to 50 milligrams you know that it's taken us so long to get there they're already um, I think it's 20 or 30 they're sitting at just now so it, there is that degree of you know the the, 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 rea the reality and the argument around the impact and the impairment is, is one that affects everybody, but it does disproportionately affect the young, is my understanding, although I'm sure Peter again can add more to that. Yes, I think the British Medical Association and the Royal Medical Colleges would, would I think, fully support both the things that you, you, you mentioned, the graduated um, uh, structure with, with, with lower limits for younger drivers simply on the basis of the demographics of the accidents that we, we see, including the fatalities weighted very much towards y younger people. Um, so though there's often talk about uh, the, the younger generation are better with drink driving than, than, than older people are, in fact, the numbers don't really don't bear that out in terms of the, the profile of the, of, the, of the serious accidents and fatalities. Uh, and similarly with um, random breath testing, uh, I, I, I do think the level of public support and understanding about the importance of drink driving is such that I... I, I, I think the general public would accept random breath testing. The, the, the UK has um, as already been referred to. The UK has made a, a great deal of progress in reducing harm from drink driving. Um, but we still have a relatively low level of testing compared to other countries. I think 15% of French drivers are tested every year. 
uh, in hours, I think, are in single, single figures in the UK. So although other countries have much to learn from us in, in, uh, in, in various ways that drinking driving has been approached, uh, one thing that one league that we're not top of is, is, the, is the testing rate, and um, so I, I think you would find the health bodies would support a process of um, of random breath testing. Okay. Can I just say, um, just make any law effective, it has to be seen to be enforced, and the, you know the penalties and the enforcement's got to be seen to outweigh, outweigh the risk of offending. Uh, you know, in that sense, you know, we would support random breath testing and a lower limit for professional drivers, like um, taxi drivers, school bus drivers, care drivers, anyone driving in a care capacity. We would support a lo an even lower of 20 megs for a, a, a lower for, for these drivers. I wonder, is that? I'm, I'm, I don't know if the, the um, police could answer. Is that ever reflected in the sentencing of someone? Um, found to be driving over the limit if they're a professional driver, commercial driver. I'm not sure of the, whether the court takes a, a harder view of it or not. No, I'm, I'm sorry, no, I, I couldn't really comment on that. I'm not, no, I'm not I wondered if it. it was reflected in sentencing just now. I don't know. Um, Roderick, you finished? I finished, thank you. Can Alison. Thank you. Um, John's covered most of my points. I do support uh, the reduction. Um, and I, because I thought it would make it much clearer for people that the message was very simple, don't, don't drink and drive, and, and I'm concerned but some of the questioning today might kind of encourage people to start less trading off and tying themselves in knots. Can I have some assurance that the um, public education campaign that's obviously going to need to be run over the next month will be a very clear one? Yes, my understanding of having uh, seen the, the the main sort of television advert is very clear, which is just don't do it, don't risk it. I mean that's uh, that because I think everything else becomes you know well it's you know I think I think Peter's given some very clear advice, but to, to that how that gets interpreted or when did you stop, how much did you drink, where, how much did you eat, you know I think these are the issues that you will then find people perhaps potentially taking a risk. And I think the simple message has to be you balance it, and you know people who are intelligent enough and can work out for themselves will be able to find that information online anyway. It's there. But I think uh, for any for any messaging that we put out to say you know so much would be enough or make sure you allow so many hours would leave your leave us open to all sorts of uh, of counter challenge later. I would suggest. Is there a sense that in the, <coughs> the wider benefit to society in terms of health benefits that there might well be a knock on effect um, in people's reduction in their alcohol consumption generally? I, I, I think there would be. You mean anything that you know encourages people to kind of reflect on, on the. Uh, you know, their alcohol consumption is, is going to be a good thing. Um, driving um, injuries and fatalities represent a pretty small proportion of alcohol-related fatalities in Scotland. Probably, uh, uh, certainly much less than 10%, and, and probably near to 5%. So there's a lot of harm that happens from alcohol, it's nothing to do with driving. Um, and, and, and of course, we've, there's been a lot of interesting things have, have, have happened, uh, particularly in Scotland, you know, to, 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 to try and a lot of productive things have happened to, to try and reduce that. So yes, I think if this is part of a, of a broader, um, you know, kind of education campaign that, that encourages re reflection people, that's a good thing. I think one important thing, though, is that we've Education on its own is a less powerful tool than we would often like to think. Um, and a combination of education and enforcement is, is, is very powerful shaper of behaviour. We, we see that with drink driving. We see that with wearing of, of, of seat belts and so on and so forth. So while you'd love to think that the answer is in explaining things clearly to people and them changing their attitudes, in, in fact, that's... Uh, a, a, a relatively we any marketer will tell you that's a real you also have to have your product easily accessible and easily bought by people so i think the combination of of, of education and you know legislation as we're talking about here is is is, is, is the optimum mix to have thank you uh, can I, can I just say, I it absolutely plain mm -hmm. and i think my colleagues here who teased out about the drinking the day before in no way support drink driving or, you know, and absolutely support the limit. I think the question we fairly asked was, you know, how, I mean, obviously, if you're daft enough to drinking late at night, you shouldn't. But there is a point at which someone doesn't know. Uh, and I think it was fair to ask, 
um, what would be a guidance, not a get-out clause. I mean, you still take responsibility for what you're doing, but some kind of guidance as to, you know, well, at this point, frankly, err on the side of caution rather than something else. I think just to clarify the position, no means do we support. And I think it would be fair to reflect from Margaret and Elaine and myself that that was our line of questioning because I think that's what people would be asking. When do I can? <laughs> you know, at what, am I okay for tomorrow? And obviously there's, at the extremes, you'll know you're not okay. And there's, and if you're not, you're okay. But there'll be bits in the middle where people are not sure uh, about the next day. And I think that was important, an important piece to test out. And I think that, uh, Dr. Rice, your information was helpful. More of that would be very helpful. It's information which the public can then decide and make judgments themselves and take responsibility for what they're doing. But they do, I think, need the information uh, put before them about what is, you know, is liable to take them into a danger zone the next morning. But well, it's not a get-out clause. Later on the next day, I mean, I yes. would be saying to people, if you've had a, a big night out, don't drive at all the next day. Yeah, exactly. Just don't, drive, don't go in your car the next day. I think just make that plain, Alice. I hope we didn't get the impression, because we were not in any way... Um, I think being frivolous or, or in any way but trying to get people excuses. And I no, apologise if you took it in that way. I think, uh, we were, I, I think one, a bit. Well, I apologise. Um, what, what, one of the points of, of the 80 um, milligram limit is that people have tied themselves in knots, mm -hmm. thinking, yeah. oh, well, it's okay because I've, I've done that. And people have unintentionally, um, yeah. as, in their minds, been caught out. And, and, and I do think that this lower limit helps to make it yeah. much clearer that actually there's just no point in, no. in, 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 in trying to say. It was yesterday I was trying no. to say. We appreciate that, but I think it, it's helpful to tease out. Can I just ask about another thing, which is what nobody's asked about, is random breath tests. Yeah. You've asked about... Yeah. I don't think I don't think do you that. think that the public are... You said the public are in support of random breath tests, which I found interesting. I think, well, what's, yeah, your, I, I, in, what's your data for that? Um, I... I, I, I I, I don't have, have data on, on, on that. Uh, I think there was a YouGov poll, which uh, I must admit I could go back and, and look at. But I, so I suppose I was, I was really just speaking from my kind of observations of the, if you like, the public having been involved in various debates around various aspects of alcohol. Drink, drink driving is, is, is one where there's a you know, particularly kind of solid public support. And I, I, you know, I've heard the, the arguments against random breath testing because of the the risk that it would lose public support. And I think what I was saying is my, my own view is summing all that up it is, that, is that the public support for drink driving is very solid now, and I don't think that random breath testing would, 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 would put that at risk and I think it would be a move in the, in, in the right direction and it's had long-term support from the health bodies. Simply testing your evidence, uh, you know, the evidence base for it because, I mean, I can see why intelligence-led breath tests uh, yes. to someone would be, would be a, 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 I don't know about random breath tests, I don't know the answer to that, and that's why I was just asking you, because we've already had the issue of stop and search, and police doing that, and alienating the public, and whether this mm. might, I don't know, just pose the question whether it might have a counterproductive effect. Seek clarification, because I thought that, in terms of intelligence-led breath tests, if somebody reports to the police, so-and-so has been in the pub drinking, and they've got into their car, you are able to act on that, aren't you? If we've got yeah. reasonable cause to believe, you know, there's the three circumstances, either committing a moving traffic offence, involving a collision, um, or in fact, reasonable cause to believe they've alcohol in their, in their system. So, I mean, so we, as we go through the, the festive safety campaign and we do, a, a, you know, a large number of, of roadside road checks, because again, we have the power to stop vehicles, to examine vehicles, to make sure they're roadworthy, particularly in the dark, there's always issues around lighting or whatever else. So, as we're speaking to drivers, thereafter we can form the opinion you know, from the uh, smell of alcohol or demeanour or whatever else, um, you know, which allows us then to, to make that requirement. Um, there has been surveys done and st studies done, particularly in Australia, around random breath testing. And uh, I think there are some questionable elements about some elements of some of the data gathering, but, uh, but most of them have shown um, a, a move towards a, a support. And last year we engaged with Glasgow University looking at a procedural justice programme around that, just the explanation of, of what we were doing. So there's some follow-up, that's still not concluded, with some follow-up work ongoing just now, but that was about, you know, again, uh, how we approached and how we spoke to people. And we did f find a lot of support because there is a, an awareness, you know, it's Christmas, it's drink drive time again. We've been doing this for so long now that when people are stopped, we, we find, I mean, having done it, you know, the coal face at two in the morning as well, <laughs> the reality is that most people are supportive. And if you ask them, do you mind providing a specimen, even though, because as we have done in the past, some of the campaigns featured on breathalyzing as many people as were willing to give us one so we can get their numbers from you know from that dramatic statistical perspective um I, I never ever had anybody who refused or who declined to do it when offered the opportunity when where there's a need to do it we can do it and we've offered the opportunity as well 
that clarifies that position. It's just that we'd never uh, yeah. gone into that. that. Sorry, John, you want? Can I just one final point on that, Chief Superintendent Murray? There's, some people might think that you know, it's an extra tool in the army, but there's nothing in your existing powers that inhibits your ability to rigorously enforce the legislation, so is there? No, we can, we can stop vehicles at any time travelling on the road, um, so therefore at that point we can speak to drivers and, and you know, that allows us to then form opinions, which allows us to, there are powers that allow, and it will allow us to do things from that point onwards. You don't have cause. You don't have cause to stop. You, can, you don't have to. So you break lights out or something. No, we, we have separate sections for that. But anybody driving on the road can be stopped by the police at any time. I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that completes the evidence. Thank you indeed. We move into private session.